And I look at it the, the same, right? We're in this world now where we're using the computers to do stuff for us, right? And I'm very much a big proponent. That's why I love scripting is if I can make the computer do something for me so I don't have to do it, right. that's awesome. And I look at the, the advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, and I look at that as that's the next step, right? And, and we have a lot of people that are stuck in this world of like me looking at my kids going, well, that's not fair. You're, how are you able to use a, <laughs> you know, something that does right. this for you? And you don't understand what's really going on behind the scenes. And you don't, you don't know how, how good, you know, we did this pure, right? Whether uh -huh. that's writing stories, writing code, uh, portraits, everything else, where people are now leveraging computers Mm -hmm. to get those answers or to do that or to give you that head start on it. Um, I look at it as the next advent. Well, Steve, how was Africa? Africa was awesome. Yeah. Where, hot, where were you hot at and muggy. exactly? Uh, in Djibouti. So Camp Lemonye, Djibouti. So just outside Djibouti City. Djibouti City? Yeah. That, 11, that's a funny name. Yeah. Djibouti City. Yeah. So 11, 11 degrees north. So it's a, dang near equatorial. Oh, okay. Uh, a super, super humid right off the coast. But yeah. What's, what's the latest happenings in, in Djibouti City? Uh, not much for Djibouti. So we're there doing mm -hmm. um, horse protection. And a lot of other uh, other missions for AFRICOM and Special Operations Command Africa. So. I got gotcha. you. Djibouti City also sounds like a club that we used to go to when I was in my 20s. <laughs> yeah. I think it's down in Ebor. There's a <laughs> right. second location down in Ebor yeah. City. Ebor City. We used to go to Djibouti City. <laughs> um, generally, you know, Africa has just been a disaster in terms of uh, conflict or ever since I've been alive, what's kind of, what are the most recent updates to what's happening in Africa? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the main thing that's going on is uh, Somalia got a new president, which he was actually the president before the last one, uh, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed. Um, and they're just, they're, they're fighting and uh, trying to counter uh, Al-Shabaab's influence. So Al-Shabaab is the wealthiest arm of Al-Qaeda of the Al-Qaeda terrorist network. And so uh, Al-Shabaab has a heavy presence in Somalia. And this this new president, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, um, he's very keen on getting back to establishing the sovereignty of, of Somalia and no influence from Al-Shabaab. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're, we're there helping in, in his efforts as well. So a lot of Horn of Africa activities. Um, so Al-Shabaab, Ethiopia had a lot of unrest, um, not last year, year before, uh, where we had some pretty high level, uh, you know, Department of State uh, events where we were uh, a lot of turmoil in Ethiopia, and so a lot of a lot of turmoil across the entire continent. Um, it's just yeah. clans, families uh, fighting corruption. against, yeah, a lot of corruption, government fighting corruption. against governments who's in control, who wants to be in control. Mm -hmm. And it's just been, it's been going on for years and years. A lot of it is um, remnants of, uh, you know, colonial era into this post-colonial era. And, you know, these, these colonial powers withdrawing from Africa after, you know, years and years of, of ruling with, with a heavy fist. And then the people then trying to figure out how do they the govern, how do they govern themselves when someone's not forcibly right. governing them? And then just that power vacuum of who who takes over. Right. Um, one of the things I really like about you, Steve, is that not only are you militarily an expert on the intelligence front, but on a systems front, when we get into geographic information systems, you're absolutely one of the top experts in, in the field. So that's what I want to talk about today was some some nerdy GIS stuff. So <laughs> geographic information systems. There's some debate out there whether it's geospatial information systems or geographic information science. At the end of the day, it's GIS. So yeah. I was hoping maybe we could just start at a very I want to start at maybe level one, then we'll ramp it up to level <laughs> 10. 
Yeah, we uh, can. For maybe, how would you describe what GIS is for somebody that maybe doesn't understand what GIS is? I think the the simple answer for what GIS is it's uh, computer uh, computerized data uh, with a spatial component that you can. Uh, overlay and extract uh, meaning, relationships, trends, patterns um, from the data, right? But it has that geographic or that geospatial component to it that lets you see uh, patterns and things that emerge that may not otherwise be evident, right? So they go back to, you know, like mid-1800s, about 1854, mm -hmm. Dr. John Snow. Um, and John Snow? John Snow, yeah. The, wow. But not, uh, this is the one that knew something, right? Not the John Snow that doesn't know anything. <laughs> you know so, nothing, John Snow. Yeah. So uh, Dr. John Snow in London, right? They had a big cholera outbreak, trying to figure out what's going on with the cholera outbreak. And then he has the idea that he's going to basically overlay data. And so he overlays a lot of different things uh, for the city mm -hmm. of London. And what he sees is a pattern emerge with cholera outbreaks where the water lines are, that mm -hmm. where the water lines are, they have these, these bad cholera outbreaks, right? And so he's able to identify a spatial pattern of, wait, wait a minute, I think that cholera may be linked to the water and the water lines within London, right? And he identifies that uh, indeed, cholera is caused by the contaminated water in London. That's what's caused this big cholera outbreak, right? So consider that like the founding of GIS. And since then, right, it's just, Collecting the data, mm -hmm. spatially, you know, referencing or geo-rectifying that data, getting it to its accurate real-world location, and then identifying patterns, trends, and everything else. So Jon Snow not Jon only Snow. helped defeat the White Walkers. Correct. He went on to found <laughs> GIS. That's awesome. <laughs> so if on a, on a basic level, just basic level, it's overlaying data on a map and relating it to other pieces of data to form analysis. Is that is that a good way of putting it? It's a good way of putting it, right? Everything happens somewhere in right. the world, right? Nothing is happening on this earth, not on this earth, right? So right. everything's happening somewhere. That's Everything that's happening has a geographic location to it, some sort of phenomenon, component, whatever. But everything is happening somewhere. We can ignore that and pretend that there's no geographic relationship to that, but... In reality, um, mm -hmm. things things are related uh, with you know with respect to location, and so ignoring that location, uh, we tend to do that at our at our own uh, detriment. Okay, so it's I would say GIS is kind of like it's kind of like the music in the background at a restaurant, right? It's it's everywhere you go. However, you don't really notice it, right? But if yeah. it's not there, you'd be like, huh, that's interesting. Yeah. What's going on? So, so here's an interesting question for you. Uh, if there was no GIS, how would that impact the everyday person? Well, GIS has its application in multiple things. You know, delivery of packages, FedEx routes, UPS routes, uh, United States Postal Service, um, school bus pickups optimization of school bus routes, um, planning of schools where you have concentrations mm -hmm. of, of children for elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. When do you figure out that you need another high school? Right. How do you decide when you need more teachers, et cetera? A lot of that all comes into play because there's a geographic component to it. And GIS helps with those decisions and, and making those decisions. So it empowers decision makers to be able to uh, you know, figure out so no, what's best, no right? GIS, we get no GIS, we get no packages. Well, we get uh, <laughs> no very, very poor delivery schedules because we can't optimize, mm -hmm. right? We can't optimize stops. We can't optimize that delivery route. Um, same thing with your mail, right? It's everything becomes delayed because, you know, mail would come in, right? And we would do like a first in, first out that that letter or that package comes in and then we go deliver that across town. Then the next one is all the way across town yeah, again not, and then you drive back optimal. across town, right? And so we have this optimization mm -hmm. that just comes inherent with GIS for things that we just, uh, that we take for granted, right? How do you decide, right? 
when we've got a like a food desert that we we have a lack of grocery stores in an area mm -hmm. and how do we decide okay hey we need to plant another grocery store here um and so that's which is actually a problem around this area you know, wilmington north carolina yeah. um and several parts of town so maybe if we had a <laughs> super powered GIS analyst. And we do have some really good GIS yeah. people in the county and in the city. Yeah. Um, we'd be able to locate some of those those places and, and make recommendations. Yeah, and it's a it's a hard thing that, that they're tasked with with city planning and city maintenance um, because you're trying to you're trying to weigh the costs and the benefit of having more housing. And then areas where you dedicate that there will be no development so that we can mm -hmm. keep a green space or some green area. Um, where do we put a park? Right. And so you're, you're trying to weigh that, you know, parks don't bring in revenue, right? You can't, can't tax a park. You can tax the people off of right. their property tax and everything else. But so it's that, that constant battle that they're trying to figure out what's the best use mm -hmm. of the land and how do we, how do we make the best use of the resources that we've got, you know, and how do we zone something? How do we balance too much commercial, too much residential, right? Too much industrial and, and trying to come up with that unique balance. And it's a, it's a very hard thing doing city planning, but GIS is absolutely integral in that where they can figure out those balances. So you mentioned mapping, route analysis, deliveries, city planning. Yeah. You're talking about urban utilization. Yeah. I mean, this is just a, it's massive technology. Uh, one of the things and one of the goals of this podcast uh, is to just put some good information out there about this yeah. stuff because no one's really uh, evangelizing the power of GIS and geospatial intelligence. So uh, hopefully we can do that. Uh, okay, so you mentioned some, some maybe uh, governmental uses of it. What are some ways that maybe the average everyday person might leverage a GIS and, and why isn't everyone doing this? Well, I think people are. Okay. Right? Um, Waze, Google Maps, Apple Maps, right. right? That the location component of here's where I'm at, here's where I need to get to, what's the best way to get me there, mm -hmm. right? Behind the scenes in that that you don't think about is there is a GIS powering that, right? Figuring out what's the best way to get you there. What's the fastest way to get you there? What's the way that gets you there without any toll roads, right? And so mm -hmm. all these different ways that you can ask that question you're asking that technically to a GIS saying, right. I want you to get me there in the cheapest route. And, and the cost could be anything from time, distance, uh, dollar cost, right? So avoid toll roads, whatever the case may be, people are asking GIS, you know, or AGIS questions throughout the day. They just may not realize that they're asking a GIS these questions. Right. They just see it as an app on their phone. See it as an app on their phone. Waze, Google Maps, all these. But behind the scenes, we had to do all the data collection. We have to figure out what's mm -hmm. the speed limit on each of these each of these roads, mm -hmm. right? So that it doesn't route you through residential neighborhoods and it keeps you on a thoroughfare or a highway right. to get you there faster. But it's all attributes of that road that you can figure out, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then the open source piece comes into play. Waze is really good with the open source piece where you get traffic reports, locations of police, uh, roads that are closed, slowdowns in traffic where it may route you around when there's an accident, right? And so the open source and that crowdsource reporting piece comes into play as well. And again, that's got a geospatial component to it. There is a policeman here in the right. median, right? There is a car stranded on the side of the road. Be careful. I'm sure, the, I'm sure the cops love ways. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so my, my son-in-law is, uh, -huh. is a state trooper. Um, but they, they use ways as well. So when someone uh, reports a policeman, like they just move, they move, they go to another location. Ah, uh, so, but yeah, they, we they, need a, we need a cold report in there yeah, somehow. They, they, they've got, they've got ways as well. <laughs> so yeah, they use it. They use it too. That's, that's funny. Um, well, that's cool. So to me, what stands out is you, you mentioned something about attributes. You may be just, just basic rundown of what, what is an attribute and why, yeah. why did you use that word as a GIS professional, as opposed to data about this road? Yeah. So it, it's, that's exactly what it is, right? An attribute is, is a characteristic uh, about the road or some sort of property. Uh, and when we're talking roads, right, we may talk about 
different things. What's its surface type, right? Is that asphalt? Is it dirt? Mm -hmm. Is it concrete? Um, because when you're talking about planning and road maintenance, that comes into play, right? How many lanes are on that road? Is that divided, undivided highway? Um, all these different things, speed limit, when was the last time it was resurfaced, all these different things about the road, um, they matter to some people. They may not matter to everybody, but right. they matter to some people, right? The general public tends to care about things like, is it closed or is it open? Can right. I use it? Um, how fast can I go on it? Um, how fast can I go without being detected? Right? So are there right. police around? <laughs> um, but, you know, all these different things about the road that they care about, um, you know, is this a main thoroughfare? Uh, in areas up north or where we have very inclement weather, does this road get plowed first, second, third, fourth, fifth, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so when there's inclement weather, you may vary your route to work based off of which roads get plowed first. And all that comes so, down to inside of the GIS. Inside the GIS. There's a data point assigned to that road and it has all of this information on it. Yeah. And this, the city planners may also take into account, right? Like average traffic flow mm -hmm. on it where they may designate, like this isn't a main highway, but this road gets used more. So if we're talking right. about plowing, we've got to plow that one. And then you get into, you know, state and local governments and who's responsible for the road maintenance and the upkeep and everything else. And so that also comes into play where the average person doesn't think about it. Um, but if something is a state highway versus a national highway versus an interstate, all that, you know, stewardship of the road comes into play. But that's, again, that's another attribute of the road is who owns it, who's responsible for its maintenance. Right, right. So on the city, state, local front, um, they're using geographic information systems for a bevy of things that we spoke about. I was hoping you could maybe enlighten people on the way that the military and particularly special operations forces use a GIS. Obviously, you don't have to reveal anything <laughs> classified or anything like that, but uh, maybe some some interesting knowledge on that. Yeah. So um, I guess I'll I'll say, you know, uh, I guess I'll caveat it with a quote from Jack Dangerman, um, who said that the application of GIS is limited only by the imagination of those who use it. So how we can use a GIS, um, what we can make it do. And, you know, I've, I've built my career off of trying to make the GIS do things that maybe it wasn't intended to do. Right. Um, you know, the, the tools, the data sets and everything else, um, tweaking those, whether that's with code or different tools or different applications to make it do what a customer needs it to do. And maybe not necessarily what the tool was intended to do. And so, that comes from getting to know the tools really well. And um, our military and the analysts and the, you know, the geospatial analysts, the imagery analysts, um, our all source analysts, SIGINT analysts, everybody that we have um, is really good at what they do. They're very, they're very highly Shout trained. Shout out to the 35 yes. golfs of the world. Uh, and the 12 and Yankees. And the 12 Yankees. And yeah. the entire 0-2. <laughs> Uh, 0200 series in the Marine Corps, the, you know, the 0241s, 0241s, 31, 61s, right? Everybody, um, you know, Air Force two, one and ones, Air can't Force, forget the Air Force. Our one and zeros, our one and ones, everybody, right? Our Space whole Force series. Space Force have a G1 guy? Uh, Space Force? I don't, I don't know yet if they have a geo. It wouldn't be series. geo, would it be moon int in the Space Force? Uh, space int. Space int? Yeah. <laughs> well, it comes down That's to, it. there's going to have to be a, or I'm sure it already exists, some type of GIS for space. Well, there absolutely, right? there absolutely is, right? Okay, and sure that's, that's, that's part of it is, you know, understanding where things are. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about it with regard to the earth and where, where they are in their location on the earth. Um, our military is very highly trained and very knowledgeable in using GIS to know and understand things. They use GIS for, um, you know, base maintenance, right? right. Understanding all the buildings, where they're at. Um, how old the buildings are, you know, when were they last refurbished? What's the square footage of it, right? If you have um, flooding in a military base, they can instantly calculate, you know, knowing where the flood was and which buildings were affected. Like, okay, it hit this square footage of buildings. Mm -hmm. We need to order this much new flooring. We're going right. to have to redo the flooring in this, in this area, right? And so the GIS helps them in, in a lot of different areas um, from just, you know, things like base 
base maintenance, operations, sustainment, to transportation. You know, when we talk about the movement mm -hmm. of uh, material, personnel, um, when we're having a mobilization or just a regular movement, right? When the 82nd Airborne gets mobilized, um, you know, or the 101st when they when they get mobilized, like there's a component in in Eastern Europe right now, right? What does that look like, and how do we move all those people, the mm -hmm. gear, the computers, the vehicles, everything they need, right? The GIS is is super helpful in that because we can figure all that out. We can figure out capacity of airplanes, ships, right? And so there's an entire command for the military, the U.S. Transportation Command, that helps figure all that out, that when we need mm -hmm. to move people and materials. Um, and then each of the component commands and the geographic commands uh, have geospatial analysts as well that help decision makers and policy makers when they're doing their planning. And that can be down to the tactical mission and, level and that and that aspect of it so so geospatial on a military side uh it's kind of broken down into two, two components i might be i might be wrong about this but you can correct me if i'm wrong uh you have the 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 planning of things like talked about like facilities uh engineering new bases mm -hmm. things like that and then you have the intelligence side the geospatial intelligence side is that is that pretty accurate yeah, I think it's probably a, a good way to think of it. The Army kind of does that distinction between, right. right? So you have like the 35 series, mm -hmm. um, right? So the more Intel based, and then you have like the 12 Yankee, which is on the engineering side, right? So right. Um, in the in the Corps of Engineers, right? And so they're very much kind of split between Intel and engineering. Uh, the Marine Corps tends to blend those. And so you get a little bit of a blend between them. Um, but it is probably a good distinction between, you know, like extracting information, intel, right, and and taking data, raw data, um, adding the context to it, the information piece to it, to where it becomes intelligence. Um, and whether that's actionable or mm -hmm. informative or whatever the case may be, um, still exists on the like engineering and maintenance and sustainment side as well. Um, but maybe there's not that uh you know operational and tactical piece to it where we're looking at you know mm -hmm. uh making some time time-based and time dominant decisions where we're very constrained with what we're doing um need to make decisions quickly um either for the uh protection uh or sustainment of life gotcha so on the geo int side the intelligence mm -hmm. side right they rely on the gis for what? What are the types of things that they're leveraging the GIS for generally? Uh, in general, I mean, it's it's the decision-making piece, right? So the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency is one of our uh, combat support agencies that the United States government has to help uh, with extracting the geographic information, the context, um, the patterns, the trends for what's going on. And that's, you know, that comes into play with safety of navigation, right? So uh, the NGA helps with safety of navigation, whether the that's NGA. the NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence I noticed Agency. that a lot of, like, most people just say NGA, but it's, yeah. you're right, it is, it is better English to say the, the NGA. NGA. Yeah. So kind of like. Shout out to the NGA. To the NGA. Very much like the Ohio State University. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Uh, the Buckeyes. The Buckeyes. Um, so. They they have uh, an entire uh, combat support agency that's mm -hmm. in charge of those things. Like I said, safety of navigation, whether that's aeronautical or nautical. Okay. Um, so they produce the the charts that basically ensure safe navigation in the skies, on the waterways of the world. Um, they have a, a key piece in the intelligence process and in the decision making process um, in feeding. Uh, critical, timely information to our policymakers and our national decision makers. Okay. So, so uh, that kind of segues into an interesting question I want to ask you about. Yeah. Um, not, not necessarily a question, but <laughs> I posted this video on my Instagram. Uh, yeah. I think it's at NDS show. Um, and it's just a video of Joe Rogan and Tim yeah. Dillon and their 
learning about what NGA <laughs> is for the first time. You yeah. know, they're on the internet and they're looking at intelligence agencies and they're like, what is that? Right. So I posted this yeah. on my Instagram. Go to my Instagram if you want to see the video. But some of the comments that people have under here are they're so enlightening to me. They really describe what people actually know or think about this this space, this geospatial intelligence space. And I don't blame people for not knowing what this stuff is. I don't blame people for for being naive and and tangentially hearing something and forming an opinion. Uh, that's probably on the intelligence community to just do a better job of communicating what they do, who they are, where they're at, who are the people involved. But some of these comments are hilarious. So I wanted to just read uh, some of these comments. Yeah. All right, this is from, I won't put their name out there. I'm sorry, <laughs> Instagrammer, random Instagrammer. Uh, 16, so in the, in the video, it describes the fact that there are 16,000 employees at NGA. Um, one of the comments was 16,000 friends and family of our senators collecting 90K a year salary to do almost nothing. It's like government welfare for rich people, a.k.a. corruption. I mean, come on, dude. Yeah, that's a I mean, that's a blatant misunderstanding of of the agency, what it does, uh, the value it provides uh, for, our, here, here. for our nation. Right. 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 Well, I, I did reply to that with like, hey, you, yeah, you <laughs> might want to look into that a little bit. The fact that NGA, as far as intelligence agency goes, they're one of the good ones. They support the military. They support all of the other agencies. With some of the things that you're talking about with from logistics to um, just straight intelligence, uh, how about like DHS supporting natural disaster recovery? I mean, NGA is a fantastic agency. So it's not I could see people kind of be in conspiracy with with like NSA and CIA. But yeah. I just don't I don't view NGA in that light. All right. Here's here's another. Um, here's another. Geospatial is basically mapping the world with LIDAR technology, like Google Maps 3D feature. So <laughs> Close. Close. I mean, that's a component of it, right? right. So that's, that's one part of it. Um, you know, I think one of the great things about, about GIS, about um, the geoint and geospatial world is you can specialize in, in one niche of it, um, and you can make a whole entire career on that niche and become a, an expert in it. Um, mm -hmm and not touch any of the other pieces, right? So you can become a LIDAR expert and be an absolute expert on LIDAR um, and know absolutely nothing about right. bathymetry, right? <laughs> Which is a very similar technology. But it's underwater. Right, but, uh, but you know nothing about it. You know concepts, right. principles of how it works, um, but you're not an expert on it. You're an expert on like LIDAR. Right. And so again, you can, you know, and then, you know, absolutely nothing about maintenance, about road maintenance and the way that you use a GIS in city planning. And so you can, you can develop an entire career based off of one niche mm -hmm. of GIS. Right. Right. And, and one of the things that uh, I will, you know, shout out to our, to our military and the, and the way that we train our geospatial professionals in the military is we give them good exposure to the breadth of GIS. Right. And all the different things we can do. And again, you know, going back to that quote from Jack Dangerman, right? It's it's just limited by the imagination of those who use it. Um, and once you know and understand how a GIS works, you know, what it is, what it what it can do, uh, really you're just limited by your understanding and of the the tools, applications, processes mm -hmm. that can help you either manipulate or extract that information to answer questions. And to and to your point. In the military, I was a geospatial intelligence analyst. Geospatial analyst is what they yeah. called it. And I didn't really fully understand what a GIS was until after years later after I got out. Yeah. And then once you understand what it is, right, It's it applies to everything. It's about uh, understanding location and all those things. Once you understand what, it, what its capabilities are, you start to notice areas like, hmm, they could use a GIS over there. Or man, if there was some some of this data here, we could get to a better uh, better answer here. Like if you ever yeah. if you've ever been to I don't know a football game and you I, I remember one time I went to a Bucks game and shout out Tampa Bay Bucks even though they they aren't going to make the Super Bowl this year. Tom Brady, please please stay just one <laughs> more year, buddy. Um, <laughs> but I remember 
entering the stadium and it, w- it was just packed full of people. Like, it, like just getting in the gate, it was yeah. packed full of people. And I remember thinking, hmm, well, this could have been planned better, right? Where yeah. the parking lots were, how people were funneling into the into Raymond James Stadium. Uh, but once you understand what a GIS is, you start to notice that we do have the capability to plan things better if more people understood what it is and what it can do yeah. and all those things. So Yeah, you you see that. Um, you know, so Cardinals, St. Louis Cardinals, uh, on their tickets, and and mm-hmm. I would I would hope that the Bucks do something very similar, where they know what section you're in, right? It's on the ticket, yeah, and it will tell you which you gate. know which gates are the best ones to use, right? right? Now that's that's a geospatial component to you're sitting at a dedicated geographic mm-hmm. location within the stadium, and they know, hey, based off of that section row seat. Mm-hmm. It's best for you to use, you know, gate one, gate two, north gate, yeah. south gate, whatever the case may be. Um, but it, yeah, it comes down to using location information okay. and very simple things like I'm going to see a Bucks game, right? right? I'm going to see a Cardinals game. And so, yeah, GIS absolutely comes into play in that. And then it gets into the whole, you know, where is the best place for a parking structure? Right. Um, you know, growing up, we had season tickets to the Dodgers. And oddly enough, our our parking location, so they were on the third base line right above the Dodger dugout. Um, our dedicated parking location where we parked was basically on the opposite end of where we were sitting. Okay. Uh, it was just outside the right field pavilion there at Dodger Stadium. And so where we parked, where the dedicated spot was or you know section was where we could park was completely opposite mm-hmm. for where we were where we were going to sit. And it gets into that, like, this could have been better planned out. Like, why couldn't we park over in this section that's closer to to where our tickets are, right? Um, especially since they were, you know, they were expensive tickets that were right on right. That, no that Dodger side, third baseline. But, yeah, it's it's one of those things where it comes into play and you you think of those things and you ask yourself those questions like, well, this is silly. Why are we parking all the way over here? This right. is nowhere near where our section is. Um, and you don't really think about that component to it but yeah 100 percent, the location comes into play in that like i said it's music in the background music in the background music in the background if it if it works and everything's fine you don't even think about it but when it's done poorly you absolutely notice it yeah 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 um well that's cool i'm I'm glad that you're uh you're a sports fan even though um, i would like to recruit you to be a tampa bay rays fan because we need all the fans we can get uh they can't get anybody in that stadium and that's actually a fun geospatial challenge right there is where do you put the Tampa Bay Rays stadium? Their stadium is located in St. Pete. Now, across, across the, problem, the, bay. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with the Tampa Bay Rays stadium in St. Pete is that people from Tampa don't want to drive across the Gandy bridge. They don't want to, <laughs> they don't want to drive across the Howard Franklin. They want to stay in Tampa. Yep. So the, you know, there's always a bit bickering about, you know, where that stadium should go because they can't get anybody in the stadium. Um, but I think that's always a, a fun, interesting spatial challenge. All right. So, um, along that line of, of challenges, what are some, some common challenges that a GIS person faces on a day-to-day basis? So I think, uh, probably the, the most common one that most GIS professionals, uh, tend to face is either access to data or access to current relevant data, Mm -hmm. right? Um, one of the biggest things that you spend your time doing as a GIS professional is trying to find the data that you need mm-hmm. to help you answer the question. Um, and so whether that's behind some sort of paid access because you have people right. that are collecting it um, for business reasons, right? Um, you know, but people that want that timely, accurate information to make decisions, um, you know, just simple things that you, you're trying to find that information and then where do you get that data? Downloading that data, is it in the right format that I can use? Do I have the right software that I can then mm-hmm. use this data to, to answer the questions that I need to, to answer, right? So, so data. Data, a, data and data access, I think is probably the biggest, um, biggest challenge that most GIS professionals face. And, and we're making leaps and bounds uh, improvements, mm-hmm. um, you know, year over year for access to data, open portals, you know, open data portals, um, cities, municipalities, state governments, county governments, they're making data more and more available uh, every day um, 
and and they're doing it as a service to the public and making that data available so people can make those decisions or use that data to make decisions. That's one of the things I love about ArcGIS. If you go in there, there's so many free data sets that you can use and yeah. they have all these tapestries and things like that that you can <laughs> you can look at. So there's there's a good question for you. Yeah. Here's the ultimate GIS question. This is this is Steve Stout. All right, hit expert me. in GIS. He's been doing <laughs> GIS for how long? Uh long older than my kids. I don't know. Uh <laughs> yeah, decades, a few decades now. A few decades of GIS. The question is ArcGIS yeah or QGIS. Uh I use both. Right? And uh I guess I'll say a lot of ArcGIS, a lot of the libraries, the back-end libraries are very similar or the same that they use. Um, I'm certified in, in using both. Um, got certifications in both. Of course you are. Yeah. Um, but I've, you know, uh, I worked 10 years for Esri mm -hmm. um, and then worked a couple years. Esri, uh, Esri, which is the company that makes ArcGIS. That makes GIS. ArcGIS. Yeah, Environmental Systems Research Institute, originally founded as. Um, now just goes by Esri. Mm -hmm. After fighting it for years where everybody was calling them Esri and they kept saying, <laughs> no, we're not Esri. We're ESRI. It stands for something. It, right. Um, then finally just capitulated and said, all right, we're Esri. Yes. Um, but yeah, so I use, I use ArcGIS. I've used ArcGIS since uh, it was created from mm -hmm. multiple components of software. Um, and so I've used ArcGIS for a couple of decades now. Um, use QGIS uh now for probably a, a decade and a half um where i've just been using i use both i use it for different different components different reasons um what are some of those reasons why you might use qgis over arcgis uh when i'm dealing with uh geo packages um qgis can open and, and what's a work geo with, package so a geo package is a specific file packaged file format that kind of contains multiple layers um, okay. and, and data. Um, QGIS is able to kind of open it and play with it a little easier okay. uh, than ArcGIS, which uh, would tend to want to convert it to a different file format uh, in order to use it and exploit it. And so I can play with the, the geo packages that are available uh, for my county. Uh, they make a lot of those available via the geo package file format. I can download those extract the information or use what, you know, use the information and kind of play around, look for parcels, look mm -hmm. for, look for land, et cetera, that I'm, you know, whatever my interest is. Okay. Now what about an instance that you would use ArcGIS over QGIS? So I guess I would say there's probably more often that I'm leaning into the ArcGIS uh, realm, uh, having used it for, for years and years, I would train people on it, um, you know, Esri and uh, NGA, NGA would pay for my travel to fly me around. They would, you know, hire mm -hmm. Esri uh, to to train their users. And um, so Esri and NGA would would pay for me to fly around the world to train users on it. So um, including to their affiliates in the UK, right. uh, Australia, et cetera. So I, you know, part of my career has been training users on how to use the software. You know, one of the best things uh, that that I've been able to do is help people learn and understand the software, so that they're they're as fast as they can be with answering the questions that their that their managers, bosses, decision makers are asking them. So when they need to ask a question like, "Hey, where is the best place to put something?" You know, or mm -hmm. "Hey, what does this new geopolitical development? What does that mean? Are we going to have to evacuate an embassy?" How do we do that? What are we looking at? Where's the best place we can land a plane? Where's the best place we can mm -hmm. land helicopters, right? So what, whatever the question is, helping people become uh, as fast as they can to get those answers as quickly as they can. So years and years, decades of using ArcGIS, uh, I'm a lot better in that. Gotcha. So I tend to default right to using uh, ArcGIS and using Esri tools and software because I know how to use it right. really well. Um, and so I can answer questions probably quicker using that than I can other ones. So that's your hammer. But 
Yeah. For all the GIS nails. For all for all the GIS nails, uh, that's my favorite hammer, right? But <laughs> there's a lot of different kinds of hammers okay. as well, right? So it's a very utilitarian um, mm-hmm. that I'm a, I'm able to know and understand the software, the tool sets, the data models, so that I can, un- you know, it's a little easier for me to use and rely on the Esri suite of tools uh, to answer questions. I gotcha. Makes that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, go with what you want. So you mentioned you were, you worked at Esri for a few years. Yep. Uh, you worked at some other geospatial companies, GIS companies. Um, what would you say is your most interesting, most interesting project that you worked on, or maybe a story from one of your projects? Um, there's there's a lot, but I think probably one of the 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 more fun projects, uh, mm-hmm. you know, one of the ones that I worked on that I that I still love, that I still look back on with a lot of fondness, um, was working with uh, South Carolina, the the government, the state of South Carolina, on their um, uh, infrastructure and critical facilities, right? And so it was a lot of critical mm-hmm. facility analysis, um, you know, where they have. Uh, critical vulnerabilities. Um, so a lot of these different, you know, whether that's universities, power plants, et cetera. And it was a whole statewide model um, for all these different facilities, their vulnerabilities, their their assets, how they're protecting them and everything else. So it was a whole analysis for the uh, state of South Carolina. Um, it was a fun project. It was a great project to work on. Um, and then we delivered like all these but different data What made it fun? Sets. Just the level of complexity or? It was understanding... Uh, all the different things that go into mm-hmm. managing a state, you know, all the energy places, all the water treatment plants and everything, uh, prisons, you know, all the different things that go into a state where it really opened my eyes for how a GIS can be used right. for doing vulnerability assessments, you know, those critical vulnerability assessments, how they're going to mitigate those mm-hmm. Um you know, and and all the different ways that they can use a GIS to know and understand the state of South Carolina, their vulnerabilities, um, you know, whether that's from hurricanes, snow, et cetera, like whatever it is, they were trying to help understand how do we, you know, where are we vulnerable? Mm-hmm. What do we need to protect? How can we protect that? And how do we protect that uh, as a good steward? of state resources, finances, taxpayer Mm -hmm. money, et cetera. And so it was really, it it opened my eyes for how a GIS can get used to basically help protect the public, right? And how do we provide services uh, without being, uh, you know, reckless with with the resources, with the infrastructure and, and everything else that you have. What was your role in that project? So part uh, data analyst, part programmer, we, we, you know, we had to come up with like a viewing thing and, a, and an ability for them to just like pick a facility and it would instantly tell them like, mm-hmm. what, what are their vulnerabilities? What are the, crit- you know, what's the critical assessment of this particular facility? Um, you know, where it falls in its ranking in the state and everything. So um, I was the lead analyst, you know, working with my manager on that project. Basically, understanding all the data, right. collecting all the data, and then packaging it all up uh, in in a good viewer for the state of South Carolina to do that. So, if I'm a entry level GIS person, or I'm just learning about GIS, what are some things I can do to become Steve Stout? <laughs> yeah. So, besides I mean, work at these places for 20 years and decades of Decades of experience. Decades of experience. Yeah. So, I mean, as I look back on on my career, and you know, how did I how did I get to where I am today? You know, what is it that I learned? Um, I had a I had a manager who took a chance on me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had the the schooling. You know, I went to school and I learned the foundational concepts, principles. But I, then I had a manager at Esri who took a chance on me for a brand new team that he was starting up, mm-hmm. and. Um, I just, I, I tried to learn as much as I could about that project we were working on. And luckily we were in charge of building a brand new piece of the Esri software that didn't exist at the time. And so we were, what is that piece called now? uh, Now it's the aeronautical solution, right? So at the time it was the production line tool set or PLTS, which then became part of the, you know, 
aeronautical solution, which then became part, you know, I think there's like an airports piece to it, mm-hmm. you know, for airport maintenance. And then there's a whole piece for planning out, you know, aeronautical routes and navigation aids and, and everything else. But we were trying to do database driven cartography, right? And so, okay. uh, it was a project where they had been doing manual cartography and hand-drawn maps for years. And we were trying to prove that you could use a GIS to do this very uh, high quality cartography. And so my career started by making the software do what it had never been designed to do before because we didn't have the tools to do it. Right. And we were, we were trying to create them. And so we were trying to figure out, I had to learn really quickly well, what tools do we have that can that could actually help us do this? Um, and then where do we need new tools? And what do we need the tools to do, right? And so it was really knowing and understanding the software very in depth to see, you know, does a tool do 80% of what we need it to? Does it do 90% of what we need it to? And then if there's some sort of deficiency there, can we either change the tool to to do what we need it to do or do we need a whole new tool to be written and if we need a whole new tool to be written then we start doing you know that type of programming and and, uh, development where we're defining the data that's going to come into it right so this is the data that's coming in this is what i need the tool to do in these scenarios and then this is what i need the output to be Um, and so we got really good our team got really good at knowing and understanding all the different tools that were available and then what we needed uh, written for us. Uh, And so we had some developers on our team, what we needed written for us to be able to get out what we, what we had promised to deliver to the customer. And so, you know, we, we joke about things like, you know, building the plane in flight. Right. Right. And so, uh, but that's kind of what we were doing. Like we had, we had promised a customer something. um, And so we were, trying to make it do what we needed it to do. So if you're so, if you're a young GIS professional. Young GIS professional, I would say know and understand the tools that you have available to you. Get to be an expert in that little niche of what you're asked to do. Um, where some, don't just become a, a button mm-hmm. pusher where, you know, they can we can train button pushers. But what really helps uh, and and the people that I ended up training and the ones that stayed in the GIS uh, world and have, have also made careers of it, I taught them what the tool was doing, why it's doing what it's doing, how do you recognize if it gives you an answer that you're not expecting, right? And so, you know, very much like a calculator where, you know, uh, I can train you to input numbers and, and to do calculations on a calculator. But when you press, you know, two plus two and it says 565, for two plus two and you write five, six, five, right? A trained professional looks at that and goes, well, hold on a sec. Right. That's probably not the right answer, right? And you go, well, but the calculator said right. five, six, five. And you go, well, let's back that up and look at it, right? Is it possible that you maybe had mm-hmm. something else stored in there, right? Something that gave you an unexpected value. So very similar to that, uh, People that are starting in their GIS world know and understand the tools, what they're doing, what you expect out of it, um, and then is what you're getting out of that tool what you expected so that you know and understand how it works. And then once you know and understand how the tool works, then you're able to do things like, this wasn't exactly what the tool was written for, but you asked me a question about something else. I know this tool can do like 95% of what you just asked me to do, even though that's not what it was written for, but Mm -hmm. I can use it to do that, right? Or knowing how to use the different tools and kind of chain them together to be able to answer a question, right? And if people are able to do that uh, as they start their careers, they become very utilitarian and they're able to provide more value than, you know, you asked me to push the button, I push the button. And it gives an output, right? And so you don't want to be that person that just, you know, I push button and and I get right. an answer. You want to be the person where they can come to, uh, you know, with a question and come to you with that question and say, hey, this is what we're thinking. How can we, how can we get there, right? Um, and that, that comes into play with things like, you know, we need to, we need to cite a new stadium for the Tampa Bay 
raise? What's the best location? How do we get, mm -hmm. you know, these are candidate locations. What would be the best location? And what are the, you know, what are the, the side effects of it? What are, you know, the positives and the negatives for each location for doing like site survey and site analysis? When you have people that know and understand the GIS tools, they can start doing fun projects like that versus just, hey, digitize these roads. Right. I mean, everybody starts out their career doing things like that. That's how I, you know, started doing digitization as well um, okay. in college, right? Digitizing maps. But eventually you get to the point where you get asked those questions. Now you're getting paid not just for like your manual labor, but you're getting paid to think and because they can ask you questions. Right. Yeah. Um, that's a good good segue to my next question, which is, uh, what is what is the best book and or piece of advice you've ever received about this profession? About this profession, could be a book, uh, could be a piece of advice. Yeah, I mean, the history of GIS uh, by Dr. Tomlinson is a good one, right? Um, that's Who a good it? one. For Tomlinson, Roger Tomlinson. Roger Tomlinson. Yeah. Okay. So that's a great book. Um, really understanding GIS, geospatial. Is that where you got your cholera story from? No. I got my co that cholera story. That actually came from a very early G like GIS 101 class that I took. <laughs> okay. And you still remember decades it. Decades and decades. Well, I mean, it was fresh, right? Like I'm right. old. So it was like, you know. You're not that old. Dr. Dr. Snow had just figured this out. And then they told us about it. And then, you know, decades <laughs> later. Jack Dangerman founds Esri. Right, right. Uh, so it was real fresh in all of our minds that, you know, Dr. Snow had figured out cholera mm -hmm. and GIS. No, but um, I guess that's probably a really good book. Um, History of GIS. History of GIS. Um, some of the other ones, you know, I, I tend to nerd out on a lot of um, programming analysis and Python. Um, years ago, I was, I was lucky enough, I was blessed to be at Esri. Uh, when we were making the decision to implement Python as a okay. as a scripting language, and we uh, Esri paid to bring in Mark Lutz, uh, who <laughs> has written books on books on books on Python and Python programming, and uh, was trained by Mark Lutz uh, in Python and learning Python. And so I learned from you know one of the key guys in in the Python world. Um, scripting and the Python language. And right. that's been uh, like super beneficial and influential why, in my career. Why was Python chosen as the language of GIS versus <laughs> C plus or any of these other languages? I, I think mainly the simplicity uh, okay. of it. Um, so the library, the libraries are very easy to write, uh, very easy to, mm -hmm. um, to override things. Um, to you know, create your own modules, variables, right? So Python just becomes super easy, um, and it just becomes a very common denominator for a lot of uh, mm -hmm. people. Um, in a is... in a few lines of code, you can do phenomenal things. Uh, whether that's you know scripting, analysis, extraction of data, manipulation of data, just uh, you know. But I got I got really good at using Python again, to like make the software do right. what I needed it to do. So, yeah. This is definitely one area where you're going to, you're going to just make me look so naive. Anytime we're talking about coding, get in there. Quick question. Yeah. What is GeoPandas? <laughs> Someone explain this to me, please. GeoPandas. All right. So, um, Python and, uh, you know, there's a whole, a whole section of Python. Um, and, Pandas is a way of, of using what are called data frames. Okay. So if you think of a uh, table-based, table-type structure, right? Mm -hmm. You're probably most familiar with something like Excel, mm -hmm. right? Where you've got, you know, rows, columns, et cetera. So pandas is a, a data frame that you can execute in code. Uh, and you're able to manipulate data very quickly. Um, Geopandas is the geospatially enabled component of of a pandas data frame. So geopandas is a way where we can uh, manipulate and extract information, uh, you know, geospatial information. So if you think of pandas as like the attribute table of like we used the example uh, a while ago on roads, mm -hmm. right? Road type, you know, road surface, number of lanes, speed limit, you know, who owns it, who's responsible for the maintenance. 
And then the geospatial component would be all the coordinates that make up that particular road segment. You know, what's the road's name, okay. et cetera. So the geopandas is a way of executing that code uh, in, uh, we, we tend to use like Jupiter, uh, Jupiter Labs, but okay. it started as something called Iron Python, which <laughs> is why the, uh, the uh, file extensions are, you know, IPy, you know, Iron Python. Okay. So. That's good. Thank you. I've always yeah. wondered what geopandas is. I always see yeah. it, you know, loaded and, you know, some yeah. somebody bringing in geopandas. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Yeah, but you, got, you got pandas, red pandas, and geopandas. Of course. Yes. Okay. Uh, we could probably sit here and talk for hours about <laughs> pandas. Um, we should. Pandas are awesome. <laughs> uh, okay. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, <laughs> but kind of along that same lines, recently we've seen this explosion of the use of AI. So uh, if you look at things like mid-journey, which you're able to go in and type in a prompt and it will pop out basically whatever you think of, right? Yeah. If you say, I want to write a dinosaur riding a tricycle on the moon, <laughs> it will make something that looks like that. Yeah. Um, if you use Dolly 2, which is OpenAI's uh, kind of similar to mid-journey where it's, where it's a text prompt and you can uh, create imagery from there. Um, and then you, there's another application called Lenza where you just upload some photos and it, it, it manipulates and uses, extracts training da data in order to pop out new, new portraits. So there yeah. was a, there's probably a week there and I guess it was a very quick, <laughs> quick, uh, trending topic where everyone was putting up these portraits, yep. right? And like, oh, these portraits, where are they coming from? That was all from that Lenza app. Yep. Um, what I'm getting at is that I feel like today we're entering the age of artificial intelligence. And I think it's mainly pushed by a couple things, which is the explosion of these applications. But chat GPT, in my opinion, is really where, where when people were able to access that for the first time is when people started to go, oh, okay, this is what the future could look like. Because chat GPT as a large scale language model, you can go in there and it will, it will write code for you. One of the first things I did was ask it to um, build some geo-referencing code and, and it pulled in geopandas. Yeah. And, I, and that's where I was like, oh, what is this geopanda? <laughs> um, but the point is these new tools that are coming up, these AI tools, what is interesting about them? What do you think about them as a just a, a professional in this space? And where do you see it going? Yeah. So, you know, that's a great question. I liken it very much to, um, I guess, you know, I used the calculator analogy before, but I liken it to the calculator. So my dad, his degree um, was in mathematics. You know, my dad learned on a slide rule, right? And then Texas Instruments basically started making calculators, um, ubiquitous where mm -hmm. people were just using calculators all the time. So he started, you know, he learned on a slide rule, was doing calculus on a slide rule, and then calculators started becoming more and more ubiquitous. Uh, when I was in high school, you know, calculators were awesome. We had graphing calculators and everything else. We weren't allowed to use them on mm -hmm. standardized exams, right? Advanced placement, you know, college board of advanced placement exams, SAT, ACT, right. our finals. We weren't allowed to use calculators. You had to learn the <laughs> concepts and principles how to do it manually. You could use a calculator, you know, when you're doing homework and everything else, but we had to learn how to do it all manually. Mm -hmm. All my kids were able to use calculators <laughs> on all their standardized exams, right? And you look at that and you go, well, that's not very fair. We had to learn right. how to do it the old way. Um, and I look at it the, the same, right? We're in this world now where we're using the computers to do stuff for us, right? And I'm very much a big proponent. That's why I love scripting is if I can make the computer do something for me so I don't have to do it, right. that's awesome. And I look at the, the advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, and I look at that as that's the next step, right? And, and we have a lot of people that are stuck in this world of like me looking at my kids going, well, that's not fair. You're, how are you able to use a, <laughs> you know, something that does right. this for you? And you don't understand what's really going on behind the scenes. And you don't, you don't know how, how good, you know, we did this pure, right? Whether yeah. that's writing stories, writing code, 
uh, portraits, everything else, where people are now leveraging computers mm -hmm. to get those answers or to do that or to give you that head start on it. Um, I look at it as the next advent. And we have to learn how to leverage that um, for, for our benefit. I don't think we're looking at some sort of Skynet, right? Some, you know, artificial intelligence <laughs> is going to take over the world. Skynet's going to become sentient, and, right? So I don't think we're there. Uh, but I the do GIS think becomes sentient? If, the gen, if the GIS becomes self-aware, uh, <laughs> hopefully the roads get plowed quicker. Uh, yeah. We, potholes get fixed quicker. As soon as a pothole gets developed, uh, it dispatches a team to go fix the pothole. That'd be awesome, right? Um, that would be awesome. But I think, you know, with this advent of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's something we have to learn how to work with um, and to leverage it. Um, college professors are in that world right now where they're trying to figure right. out, like, how do you ban students from using AI to write their papers? Well, you can't, right? Like, a, mm -hmm. an AI just passed, you know, his MBA exam from Wharton, right? The Wharton professor gave an AI... I think ChatGPT, right, just passed uh, an MBA exam from a Wharton professor. So how do you stop it from doing that? Well, you're probably not going to stop it. The question is, you can have the AI kick you out things, but do you understand what it's giving you? Do you understand what you're getting, right? And so I uh, had a colleague uh, just yesterday, he asked ChatGPT to write him some Python code. You know, hey, mm -hmm. write me some Python code to query all the users in this GIS portal and, and print out all the users in the GIS portal. And so it kicked him out of code snippet. And I said, hey, that's good. To make it better, you could have asked ChatGPT these different questions. Right. Hey, I want you to give me some code. Write me Python code that will query a portal for all the GIS users in the portal and then give it a few other criteria parameterize the portal URL, mm -hmm. parameterize the username and password. I also want to obfuscate the password. When I pass you that sure. username and password, I want to use maybe an encrypted file, right? So a lot of different things that you can ask, right? And so it gives you a starting point. But if you don't know what you're, what you're right. dealing with, the output from the AI doesn't mean anything, right? So when it tells you, here's some GeoPandas code, and you go, I have no clue what GeoPandas is, right? <laughs> so you ask the AI to do something for you, but if you don't know, like, understand about it, mm -hmm. it gives you an answer, right? And I think we're very much in that kind of like uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where the answer is 42. The problem is we didn't understand the question, right? So it gives you the answer, but if you don't understand what it is you were really asking, you go, well, what does that even mean? Oh. Maybe we have a little more, little more to learn, right? And so <laughs> we can ask these questions of, of AIs and of ML, but, you know, I think one of, the, one of the things about it is understanding that answer. I think one of the funnier stories about AI, um, right, is the Marines who just defeated the image uh, detection, right, the object detection. So it was trained to pick up humans walking, right? So they trained this machine learning <laughs> Uh, for like identifying human characteristics, you know, gait, arm swing, leg swing, to be able to pick them up. And then the goal was to make it to uh, this machine without getting detected. And so the way that these Marines were able to defeat this detection was they hid under cardboard boxes because the machine was trained to pick up on humans walking, right. not a cardboard not box cardboard moving <laughs> it, within its field of view, right? It didn't understand what it was looking at. So, I mean, that's the big thing with machine learning so the is we're, we're training it based off what we want it to be able to identify. And so if you give it something that you didn't train it on, it doesn't know what to do with it. Like a cardboard box moving across its field of view. It thinks, oh, that's not important. Right. I don't, I don't need to worry about that. Whereas if a human was walking across, it would have flagged it and said, hey, I identified a human walking. And so that's, I think it's one of the, uh, you know, funnier stories, anecdotes about AI and ML mm -hmm. is you can train it, but the people that trained it were those Marines and they knew 100% how to defeat it, which is we trained it to identify people walking. Right. So. Well, you, you said a few interesting things in that. Um, the first interesting thing was that you mentioned the Marines did something smart. So hey, as, a, hey, 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 no. as an army guy, I'm, I'm <laughs> flabbergasted. Uh, 
No, but uh, you mentioned that chat GPT passed the MBA exam, yeah, which is amazing. Well, guess what? It's also passed the law school exam. So this is from CBS News. <laughs> um, Jonathan Choi, a professor at Minnesota University Law School, gave chat GPT the same test faced by students uh, consisting of 95 multiple choice questions and 12 essay questions. Chat <clears throat> in a white paper titled Chat GPT Goes to Law School. So look that up if yeah. you're curious to what this is. Um, published on Monday, he and his co authors reported the bot scored a C plus overall. So, hey, it's, it didn't get an A plus, but C's it, get a degrees. C, a, C, <laughs> a, C, a C plus uh, Chat GPT has passed the law school exam at Minnesota University. Yeah. Which is probably better than anything I, I would ever do. Yeah, it's already, it's already got me beat, right? So, <laughs> but I think, you know, a very interesting thing about it, right, is it's drawing on hmm. the collective knowledge that we have and that we've recorded and that we've made available in all these different databases and repositories and everything else. Right? One of the funnier things I've ever heard about, you know, what would you tell somebody uh, if you travel to the past and it's, you know, hey, I've got a device in my pocket that contains the entirety of human thought and existence right. that I have access to. And I use right. it to argue with strangers <laughs> and look at cat videos, right? So <laughs> the the AI has access to that entirety of human thought that we've recorded, that we've got available via repositories, databases, and everything else. Computers are really good at finding, you know, looking for that information and finding relevant pieces. And that's exactly what it does. I mean, if you were to write a research paper, that's what you're doing, right? right. You're going out and you're doing the research. You're manually doing the research. The key is the computers can do that very quickly, right? They can do that research, mm -hmm. figure out what's relevant, what's not relevant. Okay, that's more relevant than this, right? Um, when we do that with things like ranking scores and everything else, right? Whether that's when you're looking for something, you know, in a search engine and how does it identify the page one results versus the page two results, right? And right. kind of the, the joke about, man, if you have to go to page two, <laughs> you know, you're looking for something <laughs> you're obscure. Really looking. You're really looking, <laughs> right? Um, but that's what the AI is doing, right? Is it, it knows and understands, hey, this is what I'm looking for. So when it needs to answer questions, whether that's on an MBA exam, whether that's a bar exam, you know, or a law school mm -hmm. thing, um, we ask it the questions. It has access to that entirety of, of human existence via the, you know, databases and repositories, and it can pull back that information and regurgitate back to you and be like, does that answer your question? Right. And apparently in this instance, it's like, yeah, to a C plus <laughs> level. I mean, right. the computer got it right to a C plus level. You know, and we kind of jokingly said, right, C's get degrees, but it was able to do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, same way with the uh, with the MBA exam that the Wharton professor administered, right? It was able to answer right. those questions and kind of regurgitate back, you know, the way you ask this question, I think I understand it enough to give you this information. And the professor's mm -hmm. able to go, Right. Yeah, that's that's pretty much mostly that's what I was looking for. So, but <laughs> it's it's no different than what a student would do through right. research and you know internet research and library research and everything else. They would do the same thing. The computers does it a whole lot faster. I know a lot of researchers have started to actually add ChatGPT as co-author yeah. on their on their papers. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned that you know a lot of college professors are freaking out about this. Uh, and rightfully so. I'll give a shout out to my wife who has started to integrate it into her curriculum and in fact encourage the students to use it. So along that same lines, yeah. what you're saying is, you know, she's encouraging the students to use the tools now because they're only going to get better. And the ones that can master it at this point are going to be the ones that drive drive the future of our economy, really. Yeah. So, I mean, very, very similar to how I talked about the GIS tools and, and mm -hmm. you know, they're written to do this particular thing, you know, but I made a career on how do I, how do I tweak them? How do I make them do what I need it to do to answer questions for customers, right? Mm -hmm. um, very similar. The people that know and understand AI, things like chat GPT, Lenza, et cetera, that can use them and leverage them, maybe not necessarily in the way that someone thought of but use right. them and leverage them to be able to answer the, the correct questions, right? And so uh, whether that's in GIS, 
you know, gives you a head start. Like, you know, we, we joke about things like, uh, you know, stack skills and, and, um, stack exchange, right. That mm -hmm. as a, as a developer and as someone that uses Python and, and does a lot of, of coding work, I use stack exchange a ton, right. Um, where you're trying to figure out how to do something. How do I do right. this? Right. So I need code that's going to enable me to do, you know, take in X, manipulate it with Y to get Z out. Um, but if I can just ask chat GPT, Hey, can you just give me a code snippet? That's going to do this. And right. it's like, here you go. Well, that saves me a ton of time. I don't have to then tweak code because mm -hmm. chat GPT knows and understands and has access to things like stack exchange and goes, Oh, Hey, I found this code snippet. I can change it for you to be able to get out exactly right. what you need. So I think, you know, professors and students that know, know that and understand how to leverage it. Mm -hmm. to be able to train people to be better thinkers, right? Let the machines, you know, let the computer do what the computer can do. And then you become a more useful uh, asset and resource because you understand and you can, you can do things that the computer can't, right? But you can leverage the computer to do all the, you know, the mundane things and the, you know, manual processing and batch processing. And I can let the computer churn away at something while I go do something else, maybe go, <laughs> go to the gym. I don't know, but you know, something, but, uh, that's, I think that's one of the good, good aspects of, of AI and knowing and mm -hmm. understanding. If you know and understand those tools, you can make them do what you need it to do. What are some areas in the GIS space, geospatial intelligence space where AI is going to either have the largest impact already is having a large impact, or you could kind of see it in the future as being the, the main use case? Uh, so I think, you know, uh, AI uh, aspect, I think one of the, one of the ways I, I think back to the, the geoint world, um, mm -hmm. right. Cause that's where a lot of my, uh, skills, experience and, and knowledge set is looking at things like, uh, geopolitical unrest. Uh, picking up sentiment off of tweets mm -hmm. and other, you know, uh, social media things where you're starting to see, you know, something happens, there's a triggering event and something happens and now people are getting upset and now you're getting uh, more phones in an area where people are tweeting and it can start to extract sentiment from their tweets and you start seeing like, hey, something's happening here. Right. Do we need to take a look at this? Do we need to call in, you know, uh, first responders, you know, is this, is this potentially going to get violent? Um, is this something so that's, that's going to become a larger geopolitical unrest event where what, what you're really talking about, and this is super interesting. What you're really yeah. talking about is mapping out people's emotions. Yeah. I think that's one of the, one of the key things, right? Where I think an AI can very quickly take a look at a lot of that and start to figure out like, is this a significant thing we should pay mm -hmm. attention to or an insignificant thing we should pay attention to? Um, you know, when you see a, a massing of phones in the Tampa area um, <laughs> and then a lot of negative sentiment. Because, Tom Brady has retired. <laughs> Tom Brady's retired or because Dak Prescott figured out how to throw a ball, right? Like whatever the case may be. Along that same line, <laughs> what is, did you watch that game between Dallas and I, Tampa by any chance? I, I was in Dallas. Uh, for that game. So you had no choice. Okay. I had no choice. So you watched this game. Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was up with that kicker? I've never seen a field goal kicker miss four straight extra points, four straight extra points. And uh, I don't know if you saw the one he took after that, it got blocked, Yeah. but that one wasn't going to make it in either. And that was in the next game. Yeah. What, what kind of stuff is going through these people's yeah. minds? Well, I think he made the, he made the fifth one, right? But, uh, did he? Yeah, I think he missed four, and then he made the fifth one. Well, one got blocked. And, yeah. and But the thing about that one that got blocked, if you look at the replay... It wasn't going in. It wasn't going in. Yeah. It was blocked by, like, an outside lineman who should not yeah. be blocking a field goal. So, I mean, you know, having played uh, sports growing up, right, you, you get in your own head, you become, yeah. your, you become your own worst enemy. Uh, you know, after that first one, you miss, and you're mm -hmm. like, okay, now I really have to make sure that I... And then he's in his own head, you know, and then he messes up the second one. Now he's really 
right, thinking right. about. Now he's concentrating too much, <laughs> and now he's not focusing on the fundamentals of, you know, laces out, Dan, right? right. So he's not focusing on those fundamentals. Uh, you know, he starts getting in his own head, and then you just, the, everything starts compounding, and now you've missed three, and now you've missed four, and, you know, you start getting... Yeah. You become your own worst enemy in that instance. So I think it's, it's, uh, sadly in that realm, it's on a national stage. Now everybody can Uh, see you failing, right? right? Where, um, instead of kind of maybe that's happening on a Mm -hmm. little league field or on a, you know, middle school or high school field, (laughs) it's now happening televised globally to everybody to see your failures and, and, understand just how difficult it is like it's not it's not easy right. to do that um and these guys that are able to do it time after time after time you know and mm-hmm. they asked jerry jones like hey are you gonna get a new kicker and he's like no absolutely not right like he's like he's made plenty of us for us during the season and if you right. look at if you look at his record during the season i mean he was he was money uh right. throughout the season and you know he was he was a lock every time it came up pretty much mm-hmm. this one game Man, are you are you a Cowboys hit. fan? No, I'm no, not no, a Cowboys no. fan. I I grew up Bengals, Browns. No, I grew up in L.A. We, you know, when I joined the military, yeah. people are like, "Hey, what's your team?" Yeah, okay. And uh, I'm like, I don't have one. They're like, "Nah, what? Do you, everybody's got a team. Everybody's got an NFL <laughs> team." Uh, but I grew up in L.A. Uh, during the years when both the Raiders and the Rams took off, right? right. Like, so Raiders went up north, and the Rams went out to St. Louis. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I joke about it, and I say. And no one noticed because we had <laughs> we had the LA Kings during the Wayne Gretzky and Luke Robitaille years. Oh yeah, uh, we had the Dodgers during those Oral Hershiser and Kurt, Kurt Gibson. Gibson years where we're and we had the Lakers during the Magic Johnson. You uh-huh. know, and the back to back to back championships where. So I joke about it and I say, the NFL teams left and no one noticed because right. we had you know LA was still a championship city that they were still winning you know the Stanley Cup mm-hmm. and and other things. You know, not the Lombardi, but that was okay. And so I grew up, you know, more of a fan of basketball, baseball, and hockey Mm -hmm. because you're there and and they're winning and you just kind of learn and love that. And just, there was no NFL to learn and love. Um, But, you know, now the couple teams are back, right? They've got the, they got the Rams back and they got the Chargers now. And so, you know, people are able to, to know and understand, but. I moved to St. Louis, uh, and I would joke about, you know, people like, but you live in St. Louis now. And I'd say, yeah, it's <laughs> going to be good when I live in a city that has an NFL team. And they're like, oh, <laughs> that's cold. <laughs> but yeah, I just, I never really got into, into NFL, got into college football yeah. during, you know, the high, you know, the, the heightened time and the heydays of like UCLA, USC rivalries. Okay. Um, just came to love college football a lot more than, than NFL. Okay. Well, that's interesting because I've I've always been an NFL, an NFL fan versus a college fan because yeah. I just feel like if I'm going to spend my time watching football, I want to watch the best of the best, not some which is exploited twenty uh, year olds. But you were you were <laughs> in the area. I think there was just a a recent posting of you know the last fifteen years of college championships have come from this oval, right? And it right. and it was an oval that circled, you know. Uh, Alabama, South Carolina, Northern Florida, where it's like, other than That's like an other athletes. than an odd year of Ohio State winning, right, or the Ohio State for the Ohio State fans, right. Other than that one odd year of Ohio State winning, uh, the the bulk of college football championships has been in that South, right? LSU, Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, Florida, Georgia, right. It's just been just a massive college football area. So you grew up right there at the cusp. Of college football greatness, and I and, and, I, you, and, and you didn't bring, like it. And what I love about this, Steve, is it brings it all back to what we were talking about before. Geospatial, yeah, uh, spatial pattern. Spatial pattern has emerged yeah. in the southeastern United States, where football players are bred and raised in mass, and that's caused them to go to universities which are nearby, yeah. or at least, um, or recruit people that are really good to come over there, right? Yeah. And and there you have it. And now that's where all the college championships are coming from. So the ma- it all, vast it all comes majority. back to GIS in the end, doesn't it? Yeah, all everything happens in a location. Right? <laughs> that's right. Everything happens somewhere. Um, so, you know, you're a reservist in the Navy, right? Yep. I'm a 
intelligence officer in the United States Navy Reserve. Okay. Um, so the officer in the Navy, you're the director of geospatial solutions. Yep. Um, what about your leadership philosophy? You know, how, what, what is your general philosophy on, on leadership? How would you describe your own thought patterns? Uh, my thought patterns, my approach to leadership is, um, you know, I, I either will train or make sure that my people get the training that they need to know and understand, uh, what's being asked of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I leave them alone to do, to do their jobs. So don't micromanage them. Don't micromanage them. Um, and then if, cause if you can train them and give them the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they need to do what you're asking them to do, um, 99 times out of a hundred, I've, I've been amazed and surprised by the innovation, by the approach and, uh, the things that the people that work for me have come up with, um, that end up surpassing maybe what I had intended. Um, and then there's, you know, there's always circumstances where, you know, they start to get off, off track a little. Um, and I try to be more like, uh, more bumper, right. If they start to mm -hmm. drift a little left or right, I kind of right. bump them back in the way. But for the most part, I, I try to leave, leave the people alone that are, that are doing, you know, that work that I've asked them to do. As long as I've either trained them or enabled them to get the training that they need, uh, in trusting them to do so to trust. do what's right, trust. Um, you know, I'll give them you know vision, intent. You know, here's what we need. Here are the here are the timelines that we're working with. Um, right, give them that information. I don't like withholding information from people. Right. Um, so that trust also goes two ways. Um, I've done that. You know, both in the navy, both in the navy side and in my civilian career, where. I tell people, you know, I'm not going to bother you outside of office hours type thing or, mm -hmm. you know, work hours. Um, if I ping you outside of these hours, it's because it's important. Right. And if it needs an immediate response, I'll let you know. But I'm not just going to be spamming you with a bunch of stuff. Right. And that goes two ways, which is if you respect, you know, I'll respect your time if you respect my time. Because if you ping me outside of office hours, if you call me at 9 p.m., I know it's important. Right. Right. So whether that's, you know, my, my sailors pinging me for something that, you know, if, if I get a call at 11 PM, I know it's probably really important and I should probably answer the phone. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I respect their time. They respect my time. And we're not just sending emails and texts and chat that are, you know, oh, Hey, this could have waited till morning, but I just want to let you know now. Right? Yeah. So if, so if you're one of those people out there that's sending emails all hours of the night or Slack messages or chat <laughs> or whatever, Here's, here's what I want you to know. All of these tools have a send later feature. Yes. If you can hit that send later button and quit inundating people's email boxes and <laughs> things like that, because they are checking them uh, instinctively. Yeah. Uh, anyways, just use those dang things. That's what they're for. And uh, you know, I just want to put that out to the universe. <laughs> the, the other thing I want to put out to the universe, when you're taking, when you're, Okay, <laughs> you're taking a left turn. You're at an intersection and you're taking a left turn, okay? You can pull out into the middle of the intersection. This is just a public service announcement. I've Anyways. noticed, yeah, I've noticed <laughs> North Carolina is an odd one. Uh, so in Southern California, you know, where I learned to drive, which that may say something about me, but uh, we do that, right? At a left turn, you pull up into the intersection and wait for the spot, wait for the timing to go. Right. Uh, if the light turns yellow, red, right, you're watching to make sure that the person oncoming isn't going to run the light. Uh -huh. uh, but then you go, right? You're you're more apt to do that. When I got to North Carolina, no, it's like they don't cross the line. And so I, I you know, when my when my kids learned to drive, this is why I brought it up. Yeah, when my kids learned to drive, I was like, let me see your your driving handbook. I got to see if that's a rule. Like, are are you not supposed to cross the line for left turns? And it's nowhere in there. Of it's just that. a it's just a habit, right? A very very much a uh, human characteristic where because everyone else does it this way, mm -hmm. then everybody in North Carolina also stays behind the line when you're making a left turn. So um, I apologize for getting us off course there a little bit. Oh, I just fine. that just popped in my head and I thought I'd put out that, that yes. PSA. Pull up, um, we, pull up when you're making your left turns. We were talking about leadership though. Yes. And I want and I want to get I want to get back on leadership. Sure. What would be one quality in a leader that you would look for? Like someone you know, if you're maybe maybe someone you admire or 
uh, just look to for guidance as a leader? What would be your top one to three qualities? Uh, I'd, you know, top one would, I'd say probably is communication, right? Uh, I think 100% of the situations that I've seen where, you know, people are upset, people are mad about something, it all comes down to communication, that something wasn't conveyed, you know, somebody had some information that they didn't share, um, mm-hmm. where just letting people know, you know, just communicating, whether that's intent, whether that's purpose, whatever the case may be, that communication would solve, you know, mistrust, distrust, you know, a lot of the issues that you tend to have in organizations where people are like, man, why are they doing that? I don't understand why they, right. well, if they would just share that intent or, or the reasoning, you know, to the extent possible that they can do that, it, it can alleviate a lot of, you know, the, the bickering, the, the backbiting, um, misunderstandings that happen within any organization. Um, a lot of that's just resolved by communication. So I think communication is the number one thing. And I think, you know, tied into that heavily, and we talked about it earlier, was trust, right? If you if you trust your people, um, you can share that information knowing they're not going to go share that with your competitors right. or, you know, blab that out on the internet or whatever the case may be, that whatever the reason is why you didn't want to share that information with them, part of that is because you don't trust them. Mm-hmm. And because you don't trust them, you're not going to share that information with them. And then as workers, because they don't trust their bosses, then they start looking at things and they look for nefarious intent. And they go, well, the only reason why or we, yeah, the yeah. only reason why we haven't gotten a raise is because, you know, they're keeping all the money for themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Cause there's no other reason why, right? Like right. there's hundreds of reasons why, but you look for that ne- nefarious intent or you assume nefarious intent. Part of, and that's all just based off of trust and communication where things aren't being communicated. And then there's that lack of trust uh, between employees, managers, isn't, et cetera. Isn't it interesting that in this day and age, with all of our tools for communication, with all the chats and the emails and the Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp, I mean, I could probably sit here and list 5 million different applications that are meant to assist in our communication, FaceTime. Uh, I don't know, million of them, yeah. Skype, whatever, if that still exists, does Skype still exist? <laughs> My point is with all of our tools, all of our technology, I still just see, I think you're right, man. I think, I think communication is so critical. Not, I mean, not just in a, from a leadership perspective, but just in putting information out to the universe. You look at the news, you look at the um, what's happening on social media, the way information spreads so quickly. Uh, we're taking in a lot of information, you know, reading headlines and regurgitating them. This, I see, you see that a lot, yeah. um, with all of our tools and technology, it just seems that communication is still lacking in a lot of respects. Like we're just not, we're not, we haven't figured that out as humans yet. In my opinion. Yeah. A lot of talking, not a lot of communicating. Right. right. So there's a lot of information still being put out. Um, not a lot of listening, not a lot of understanding. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, some of those key components of communication, um, understanding intent, right? It's what email, uh, you know, text messages, Facebook, it's horrible to try to convey intent. Right. And, yeah. and tone and meaning um, and nuance, understanding nuance of communication that you you can get and you can understand uh, when it's face to face, but it doesn't come through in text messages and email. And you know that's why we tend to use things, you know, a lot of exclamation points and um, you know using ellipses to pause and conversation mm-hmm. and sentences to try to get people to understand the way I'm typing is the way I'm trying to talk to you right now. And you know, using emojis and conversation and everything else to try to you know, either lessen the blow right. of something by putting, you know, a, a smiling face or a laughing emoji. Um, and we try to do that to try to convey what we're really trying to say in that communication. But yeah, hundred percent, we're, we're not really communicating. There's a lot of talking, a lot of dissemination of information, but not a whole lot of communication happening. To bring it back, yeah. to, to go full circle, full circle, right? We're talking about leadership, talking about communication. Yep. Uh, what are some areas 
within the GIS space um, that you see as a leader in the GIS space um, that need to be improved as a as a as an industry as a professional just understanding those those gaps you know, where where do you think the major improvements need to come that's a great question i think um you know some of the you know recent developments in in technology uh, really help drive some of the pieces about getting information getting answers quicker right um I think some of the great things that happen uh, with GIS are some of the, you know, tipping and queuing mm -hmm. piece. Uh, so from GIS and GON, that tipping and queuing piece, uh, the messaging piece about, hey. Can you explain tipping and queuing? Yeah. So, you know, we talked about like the, the social geopolitical unrest mm -hmm. piece, right? Where if you start to see some sort of pattern or something happening, some event that's happening, the, you know, that that can like tip or cue that, hey, maybe we need to collect or send something. So right? alerts, notifications. Alerts, notifications, right? And it can be some, it doesn't have to be something like a geopolitical event. It could be something like, you know, a weather storm, you know, a storm is sure. coming to an area, right? And sending out notifications, hey, you are in the intended path of this tornado. You are in the intended path of this hurricane. You are probably going to Right. see the effects of this significant weather event, mm -hmm. you should be aware. If you are not in a position or, or a location where you can withstand this significant weather event, you might need to move. You might need to take shelter. Um, we tend to do that a lot um, after the fact or when things are too late and, you know, then we have, you know, weather channel shows up and, mm -hmm. you know, then you, you're doing these cool broadcasts where, you know, the wind's blowing really heavily and, and whatnot. But if we can... What's that guy's name from the Weather Channel? I forget his name, but yeah, it's one of those things where if, if <laughs> he's he around here a lot. Yeah, if he shows up, you're in trouble, right? But... Uh, <laughs> that guy. Yeah. So if you... Um, yeah, you can look him up. I'm totally Googling yeah, it. Yeah, look him up. But if we can get people... And again, this goes into if we can do that tipping, queuing piece ahead of time where we can know, we can know with a little more lead time where we can get people safe, we can we can save lives mm -hmm. by doing it, right? It's not so much, you know, that the geopolitical event, but it could be a weather event where, you know, if we can we can save people's lives, we can get that information out quicker. Um, you know, and, and we say things colloquially and, you know, maybe with some nuance where we say things like, oh, if it saves just one life, well, it's worth it. I mean, if that's your grandmother. That's right. your grandfather that whose life gets saved because we got an answer five minutes earlier than we would have. And we can get a boat crew out to them five minutes earlier, save their life. You're probably pretty grateful for that. So it's something that we kind of say dismissively a lot or, mm -hmm. or people tend to dismiss. But I think it's very key, um, you know, public safety, saving lives and and using GIS. And if we can do that and, and get those answers out, right? So you, I, I think that's one of the, the great things is if we can leverage things like, you know, AI, ML, and everything else, where we can get answers out where maybe if the system is looking and monitoring and it sends us that information before I ask it for that information, mm -hmm. right? Uh, minutes matter in some of these instances. And I think that's where GIS is going, where if it's got access to a lot of this information, we can get those answers quicker because the machines know what I'm going to, you know, the machine knows what I'm going to ask it because I've asked it that question mm -hmm. multiple times. So now it knows what to look for and it can give me the answer before I ask it. And you can say, Hey, there's a storm developing over, you know, the, the Atlantic ocean and it's heading toward the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. You should probably be aware of this, right? So, so you think safety is a big area that it's kind of underutilized and you don't have to wait for Jim Cantori. Yeah. Jim Cantori. <laughs> I've Googled it. Yep. Um, yeah. To be at your your grandma's funeral, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of the things where I think if we can, if we can figure that out, um, and we can get those, those answers, those alerts, uh, a lot quicker, right? Mm -hmm. It's what's the harm in knowing a, an, uh, a hurricane or a tornado is coming hours before, right? Knowing that it's coming right. could give people enough time, right? And then we don't see things like runs on stores, right? Where we can have, Distribution yeah. centers, you know, Publix, Winn Dixie, all these stores that are normally then get raided mm -hmm. for supplies that their warehouses can 
you know, start sending more material instead of just waiting for the shelves to get emptied. More TP. More TP. Why why more do people go after the TP first? I don't know. I don't expect you to know this, human, human nature, I guess. <laughs> right. Like it's it's out all of about, all the things you're worried comfort. about running out of, you know, it's you yeah. know, God forbid you have to use one ply, you know. <laughs> uh that's I always find well, that in every, interesting. Everyone in the military will tell you why you don't want to use one ply. <laughs> Uh, the military, yes, always going <laughs> full bore on the quality of their TP. Yeah. Uh, any military person can tell you that. Um, great. So along that, the kind of the same lines of you know identifying gaps in GIS and areas where we could improve as as the GIS industry can improve. I should say. Um, you think safety is is a is a key area to that. I think that's the one where uh, it's very easy to get the public to rally behind. Mm -hmm. um, and, sure. and to understand the real impact, it's a, it's a tangible, quantifiable, measurable thing that, that people can get behind, mm -hmm. right? It's saving lives and public safety. Um, knowing that, um, you can, you back it up further and further to go, okay, well, if, if we're going to get you the answer quicker, we need this, we need that, we need better data. We need better alert systems. We need better, you know, whatever the case may be, better predictive models, whatever the case is, um, it you know, you start backing it up into how to drive to get to where you want, which is you you want us to use this to save more lives so that we don't have a Hurricane Katrina level event. Right. How do we keep it from being a Hurricane Katrina level event? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's there's things that we, you know, that we aren't able to control, right? 100% there's things we can't control, but then there are things that are within our control. Um, and if we can leverage GIS and systems that we have to be able to help us in that regard. I think that's something that, that the public can get behind. Okay. That's a, that's a, a great point. I believe a lot of the legacy GIS systems are, they're more on premises. Is that, is that pretty safe to say? I, and what I mean by on premises is that they're run out of a local machine, yeah. right? Or server, uh, Lately, there's been a push to move a lot of things to the cloud. What, why would why would a city government, a company, why would they be interested in moving a GIS architecture to the cloud? Yeah. So it's you know it's funny seeing this right. Uh, so before my dad passed away, we talked a lot about computers. Right, his whole background was you know mathematics and computers, um, and he's you know we used to have like mainframe. Mm -hmm. And then terminals that you would connect to the mainframe. And then we went to like personal computers and we kind of moved away from that mainframe. And then now we're back to the cloud. And he goes, we're just, we're back to what we had before, which is mm -hmm. lightweight terminals, you know, uh, lightweight <laughs> machines that connect to a cloud or connect to a server. And he's, he's like, we've just, we, we've done a 360 from, you know, where we were, where we kind of where we started. I think one of the main reasons why shifting to the cloud where that becomes important is, you know, Access to that information uh, is, you know, timely and critical where you can access that information on whatever device you're on. Mm -hmm. You're not worried about, uh, oh, that's on, so, you know, that's on Nick's computer that's powered right. off. And the, the yeah. information we need is on Nick's computer. And so we need someone to go into the office to turn Nick's computer on so that we can get that information so that we can make decisions. Um, moving to the cloud, it makes that information available, it makes that information ubiquitous to where everybody has access to it. Everyone can use it. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a, you know, street, you know, roads maintenance department that is responsible for taking care of the roads. If they can make that information available to the rest of the city, the rest of the county, the rest of the state, then everybody's able to make those decisions. And I think one of the neat things about kind of this tiered model with GIS, you know, local governments up to county governments, up to state governments, up to national government, is you can have the people responsible for the things that that they are responsible for that they know the most. Right. Right. Um, let them, the experts, you know, the experts in New Brunswick County tell you all about New Brunswick County. Right. The experts in Moore County can tell you all about Moore County. And don't expect people in, you know, in, in uh, Wake County to be an expert on things happening down in New Brunswick County, right? Ask the people in New Brunswick what's going on in their county, right? I think that's a key piece of GIS that comes into play where you're asking those local experts to mm -hmm. be the experts on their data 
they put it in, they make it available to everybody, and then it becomes a trusted source, right? So where would you go to get the best data on New Brunswick County? The New Brunswick County website, right? Like ask them. Don't ask the state of North Carolina, what's the best data for New Brunswick? Just ask mm -hmm. New Brunswick. And so I think that's one of the great things about making this data ubiquitous and available. And then a state government can look at it and go, well, hey, I've got data from Wake County and Person County and Moore County, you know, and Lee County. And I can combine it all together to make one great state statewide data set. If they were all in the cloud. If they were all in the cloud. Whereas otherwise, if you wanted that information, you know, if you were a state employee, mm -hmm. you're going to every county's website to get that information, mm. you know, or if you were the county, you're going to every city's website or you're going to every city country, trying to get that information. At the federal level. Yeah, and at the federal level, you're trying to go to every single state to get that information. Whereas if people are making it, you know, available, open and available, then it just makes it a whole lot easier for people to, to know and understand what's going on. Um, the the trust piece comes into play because you can trust that data mm -hmm. that it came from that state government and the state government got it from the county governments right and right. the county government got it from either the cities or from in areas where it's you know not a uh incorporated area that they're responsible for it so i think that all comes into play where just that you know making data free open and available just helps everyone out that's interesting you say that because it seems like in a lot of respects, it's 2023. A lot of a lot of our normal applications have been moved to the cloud. Our, yeah. The things we use on our phones every day are to the cloud. But these city, state, local governments, uh, all, you know, they haven't made that that transition yet. Maybe because of funding, but maybe because of the complexity of their systems and things like that. But it just seems like, man, how much better are we going to be in the future? Because we've we've done all these things. We pushed up to the cloud. We're leveraging AI. Yeah. We're using all these these new technologies that are available. We're really squeezing the the juice out of that orange, you know. Um, I think that's always, I always like to think about that, which is, um, are we actually using the tools that are already available, right? Are we actually getting the most out of what we can do right now? Um, as fun as it is, and as much as I like to talk about the future, uh, it seems that even today we're just not we still don't get everything that we we could out of um our systems and tools yeah so i you know i think it's an interesting thing with you know these with local governments and why haven't they moved to you know why haven't they put their data out you know up on the cloud why haven't they moved to you know a, a portal mm -hmm. system or why haven't they put their data up in this open open mm -hmm. data portal and whatnot um but a lot of it, they look at it as, you know, hey, we're in a boat, right? And we're we're moving along. Um, and a lot of times they may look at it as you're asking me to like abandon my ship, right? Abandon right. ship and tread water while you either build a boat back on shore and then you're going to come <laughs> up to me. But you're asking me to tread water until you get your your boat up to me when I'm in a boat that's working right now, right? And I'm a little safer here. And so... They don't see a lot of times the the value or the benefit until you can bring that mm -hmm. newer boat right up alongside them and say, "Hey, you know, if you if you come over into this boat, you know, right. we can go faster, better. We can get this information out to you." Um, and so, I've done I've done a lot of GIS migrations uh, with a lot of different customers, and it, that key piece comes into play. Um, you know, the trust piece showing them that, hey, this can do what you need it to do for your mission. Um, and we can do it without any loss of mission, without any, you know, huge downtime that you might be fearing uh, to make that switch or to make that jump. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of governments, you know, whether that's local, county, state, uh, national, um, you know, they're, they may be hesitant to make some of those switches. But as long as you can show them that, hey, there's, we're not going to lose any functionality and we're mm -hmm. not going to lose any access, then we can, we can make these jumps, make these switches, make these technology shifts, and then we can accelerate further. But we, we got to get them over into that, that other piece in order to do that. Some of them do it on their own right. um, because they've got the funding, the personnel, the ability to do it. And some of them, you know, it's a one man, one man shop, you know, right. one woman shop for, for that county. Um, they just don't have the funding, availability, resources 
um, you know, their knowledge. Yeah, one, one person, they're mapping out their whole county. They're right? doing just the whole county by themselves, right? The um, and they might just be in maintenance mode. They they're, yeah. they can't afford to jump into innovation mode mm -hmm. and improvement mode um, because they've got so much work that they're doing. And so that's where a lot of, you know, boutique GIS firms and, and whatnot come into play mm -hmm. where they can help people with that migration. You only need that GIS firm, you know, for the surge piece. Right. And then they're able to help you stand up the new system, move your data over, you know, and then get you off and running in that new system. And then they can step back. And um, so GIS migrations are a, a great uh, way for a lot of, you know, boutique GIS firms to, to help out local governments. One of the reasons that I always tell younger people why they should consider this geospatial career is because of the community. I, from my perspective, whenever I've needed help on something or just couldn't figure something out, I was either able to find it online pretty easily yeah. or ask a few people at a conference or something and they come up with an answer. What are, what are your general thoughts on the GIS, geospatial, geoint community? Uh, for as large as it is, it's I still consider it a very small community. Um, when I look back on my career, uh, every single one of the jobs I've ever gotten was because of knowing someone who knows someone, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, knowing someone and then they say, hey, we've got an opening or hey, they're hiring or hey, you should talk to so-and-so, right? Or someone reaching out and saying, hey, uh, I've worked with you before. Would you consider coming to work with me again? Right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's a small community for as large as it is. Um, People move around between companies, but those relationships are are everlasting and endearing. Um, so, you know, over the course of a few decades, I've crossed paths with a lot of the same people over and over again, mm -hmm. where I'm working for one company, they're working for another, and then it switches. And then now they're working for the company I used to work for. And, right. you know, it's, it's just the nature of the business. Um, but those relationships uh, are everlasting between, right? You know, bridges burned. Uh, last for a long time, uh, mm -hmm. you know, friendships spurned can, can still come back to haunt people where, you know, people ask a lot of times, you know, Hey, uh, this person has something on their resume. Like, Oh, I was at, at this, you know, uh, the five twelfth GPC. Oh, you were there, weren't you? Or, you know, someone that was there and then they ask, you know, Oh, Hey, you know, well, I would, I didn't serve with them, but I was, you know, in the 66th GPC and, you know, right. they worked with them there. So this world, you know, and this community is very, very small and, and very networked and very nuanced that, you know, people, uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon type thing, right? right. It's like, yeah, well, if you don't, sure. if you don't know them, you know, someone that knows someone that knows them kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to get people's, uh, you know, take understanding mm -hmm. thoughts on candidates, um, you know, work ethic, you know, past relationships and whatnot. Um, but over a couple decades, I've seen that over and over again is mm -hmm. it's really the relationships that, that tend to, to come out. When I think about GEOINT and NGA, I always say that NGA is the largest government organization that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> it all kind of goes yeah. back to what we were talking about earlier with uh, just maybe poor communication or lack of understanding from the general public. Um, yeah. But I always say that NGA is the largest intelligence agency, government agency, whatever you want to call it, that no one's ever heard of. A lot of people don't even know that NGA is in the intelligence community, one of the 18 members of the intelligence community. Yep. Shout out to the new member, Space Force. You know, <laughs> you can crack, a, crack a cold one of the Space Force, I guess. Um, what are your general thoughts on the state of the intelligence community in 2023? Um, I think in, you know, we do tend to joke about that. I think part of that is the, um, kind of that reluctance in being part of the intelligence community and, and being entrusted with a lot of, uh, you know, the nation's information and the nation's sensitive and most sensitive information, um, and having, uh, the stewardship over that and having the charge to, you know, protect that. I think it's very uh, difficult to then also have a very public face where you're you're actively telling the public, hey, this is who we are and this is what we're doing, <laughs> right. right? And so there's that weird uh, dichotomy 
between, you know, how do I protect information and how do I also, as a public entity or as a government, you know, a piece of our government Mm -hmm. uh, where we're beholden and we have to answer back to the public, this is what we're doing with your money. This is what we're doing with your resources. And so it it is hard to like, you know, kind of want to say like, yeah, no one's ever heard of them or, mm-hmm. you know, they're very secretive in this agency, you know, this shadow agency, but it's really not. It's just, they have a charge to, to protect a lot of information and, and procure a lot of information and provide as much of it as they can back out to the public. You know, we, you talked about in the case of natural disasters where NGA then helps out. Uh, in in a lot of mm-hmm. you know natural disasters and response where they um, provide assistance to domestic agencies like DHS, right? Um, but they have that charge as a national intelligence agency where you know they're part of the IC. They're also a combat support agency where they help the DoD, um, and then they also have a piece where they help out you know Homeland Security and D you know. DHS and FEMA, and and they kind of all tie together. And and NGA is across the breadth of that, where they're part of the key intelligence agency. To answer your question about, you know, the state of the IC, you know, where they're at in 2023, um, I think stronger than ever. I think a lot of, you know, the cloud-based systems Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of this information sharing where we're seeing information not be siloed between agencies, um, you know, and as you look back to some of the, the critical events of the last couple of decades, you know, um, with, with 9-11, where we had a mm-hmm. lot of siloing of information, um, you know, we had mentioned, you know, special operations before, and you look back to one of the key founding events of, you know, SOCOM, right? Um, and, and understanding special operations command and then even joint special operations command is how do we work together and how do we not have that information siloed? I think the IC is making leaps and bounds uh, in as far as sharing information across agencies, mm-hmm. um, across federal civilian type agencies like the FBI and sharing information with the DOD and sharing information with some of the key uh, larger intelligence agencies that people think of like DIA, CIA, NGA, uh, NRO, right? So all these different agencies and how do we share that information and who's responsible for this piece, who's responsible for that piece. Um, it's a whole lot easier now. And I, I think, uh, I'm, I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing, you know, from, from what I've seen over the last couple of decades to what I see Mm -hmm. currently and what I, what, where I see the IC going, uh, I'm encouraged by, you know, I, I'm seeing a lot more, uh, interagency work. I'm seeing a lot more uh, collaboration between IC partners. Not a whole lot of you know. This is my fiefdom. This is my kingdom. Mm-hmm. You know, don't you know? I, I take my ball and I'm going home type thing. Right. right. I don't see a lot of that anymore. Where I think you know that there there was there tended to be a lot of that, uh, especially when you're you're asking people to share and they're they get a little defensive and they're like, well, why? Why <laughs> do I have to share that with them? Right. Right. And they they want to know, but you know, as we break down a lot of those, those barriers and get the information out and getting that information out and ubiquitous and getting into, you know, more decision makers hands so that they can make the best decision with mm-hmm. what data we have available. Um, I think, you know, we, we enable our, our decision makers, uh, to be able to make better decisions by getting them that information instead of hoarding it and only allowing certain people, uh, you know, to have access to that. So, yeah. Again, protected though uh, within, mm-hmm. uh, you know, authorization, access, need to know, and everything else. But you know, we're we're getting that that shared piece across the across the IC. So, if somebody with a security clearance, a high security clearance, I would I would uh, <laughs> no comment. Say, <laughs> uh, oh, are you not allowed to comment? I don't know. Um, what are your thoughts then? You mentioned trust. You mentioned how yeah. agencies have a responsibility. This is a great term. Um, they have a responsibility. Um, what are your thoughts on the recent just debacle with these politicians? And this isn't a political question. This is this is an, an intelligence community question. This is a security question. What are your thoughts on files being kept at Donald Trump's hotel, Mar-a-Lago? Yeah. 
Joe Biden files all over the place in cars and garages. Mike Pence, I believe, just got busted keeping these classified files places. We know Hillary Clinton's whole thing with her email server. Yep. What does it say about, I mean, I have so many questions here. I probably <laughs> sit here and talk forever. What does it say about the leadership um, in that realm? But more importantly, just how does the average person with a security clearance in the intelligence community, what are they thinking when they see stuff like this? I, I think there's just an inherent level of frustration when you see, you know, some of our national leaders uh, making what would, what appears to be reckless decisions on the face of it. Right. Mm -hmm. That it appears to be reckless and, and we can criticize and say, like, oh, you know, how how they, well, if that was me, I'd get busted down. You know, they would, right. you know, they would absolutely not, you know, allow me to do that. You know, and I've done these, you know, cyber awareness every year I and mean, I have to do these GMTs every year. Why don't they, you know, how could they be so reckless with this? But I think it goes back to. As someone in the intelligence profession, in the intelligence community, yes, you get that training you know, year after year after year, safeguarding of information, um, you know. Shout out to corrective, the, to the corrective computer handling. animated dude with yeah. the blue shirt. Jeff? Yeah, and yeah, he's always like trying to hand you a file or something. Oh, do you answer the door? Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's Tina. <laughs> Tina's the bad one. Jeff's the good one that we're trying to help out, right? Uh, yeah, not today, Tina. Um, but, we, you know, we joke about that and we say like, geez, how could you, how could you be so reckless with that? But I think one of the key pieces is, we get trained and that's, you know, drilled into us, you know, safeguarding of information, mm -hmm. um, proper handling, you know, of classified information where that's a key piece, you know, part and parcel to our job as intelligence professionals or people with security clearances where we then expect decision makers and policymakers who are, you know, they get security clearances so that we can tell them you know, when they say, hey, we should do this or we shouldn't right. do this. Right. And we say, well, actually, hang on. Uh, we need to do this because mm -hmm. and and here's how we know this. And it's sensitive. This information, you know, what we have is sensitive or how we got it is sensitive. Um, and so I, we need to tell you this piece. Right. And we tell them that behind closed doors. But they have to be read into that. Um, you know. I think it's it's difficult for us to then look at it through a lens and expect them to have that same level of, you know, understanding and nuance to it and understanding why this is so important, like why mm -hmm. you don't keep this in your house, why you don't keep this on your own personal server where they don't they don't think anything of it because they just think like, oh, yeah, that's it's secret because, yeah. you know, the military told me that answer. Right. Or that it's it's top secret because this came from here and they don't really understand a lot of the nuance behind what we're protecting. Right. You know, whether that's sources, methods, um, you know, or or tactics, techniques, procedures where they don't understand that piece of it. Mm -hmm. And so when we see it as cleared intelligence professionals, when that information is mishandled or when it's leaked, we get upset about it. Right. And rightfully so. Because we're doing our part to make sure we're doing everything we can to make mm -hmm. sure we're doing the right thing and protecting information, protecting sources and methods. And then to see it, what looks like just flouted, that you're just keeping information wherever you want. Right, right, right. Right? And we get told, like, you can't bring information home. Documents have to stay within the secured mm -hmm. facility. You need to secure them appropriately. And then we see things happening that looks like it's flaunting it. Um, it's a little frustrating. But I think there's also a key piece of understanding there that like that's not what they do day to day, right? Well, um, and so it's it's I hard. I think you're to, letting them off kind of easy, Steve. Uh, I, mean, I have to, I have to yeah. say, I think you're kind oh, of well, letting them off. I will easy. say I'm like, letting them off easy. I'm I'm somebody, trying to understand somebody like how they do something. You're, you're trying to walk them out on their shoes. That's empathy. That's a great quality of a leader that you have, Steve. <laughs> In my opinion, though, uh, you know, look at somebody like. Trump. Okay. Yeah. This is a guy he, you know, I, I can ex look at him and say, okay, he hasn't spent any time in the intelligence community. He kind of, you know, went hot and heavy as a politician and, and kind of really got lucky if you think about how he became president. Um, and then he was kind of, you know, all of a sudden he's the president of the United States. And, and I could understand that for, for him to be, you know, mishandling classified documents and things like that. When I look at somebody like Joe Biden, who's been in government forever, I yeah. mean, the guy's been in, in government forever. I just, I don't see it. 
Mike Pence, same thing. He's been around forever. Yep. Hillary Clinton, I mean, come on. she's She's been around forever as well. I, I just, to me, it seems like there's two sets of rules. There's the rules for politicians, and then there's the rules for the rest of the intelligence community. And I'm okay with that, actually, if they just say, you know what, they don't have to follow the rules for this for these reasons here, right? Yeah. There's we there might be some good reasons, which is, you know, they need to have files because they're important, right? These are important people that are making big, yeah. big decisions. They need to have files at their house because, you know, they're living they're living that life where they need to have that stuff. Um, but I think that just it needs needs to either just be published and be like, okay. You're, you know, as an intelligence professional, you're under this set of rules. As a politician, you're falling under these set of rules. Um, but to to suggest that, you know, we're we're under the same the sun, the same guidance is just yeah. it's just simply not true. Because if you or I had classified files, if we mishandled information, if yeah. we did some of the things that that these politicians have done, uh, I'm pretty sure that we'd be in jail. I, I'm pretty sure that we'd be. Yeah. Um, no, in trouble. You'd be court-martialed yeah. on the military side. L lose your clearance and everything else. But, I, th you know, that actually goes into, you know, some other key pieces where things like the Hatch Act that mm -hmm. govern, you know, from a certain level down right. that people will behave in a certain way, that you will not use, you know, your government status to promote, you know, mm -hmm. political parties, stances, mm -hmm. candidates, et cetera. But the Hatch Act is very clear. And, like, from this level up, it's okay for them to do it. Right. I think if we had something like that, people people would know and understand and, you know, that, yes, from this level up, mm -hmm. because of what we're asking them to do, they need, right. you know, instant should access they, to classified information. But there should be some, well, Isn't there some, some of them do have handlers. some dude that yeah. is like, just the vacuum, you know, he's got a vacuum, he's going around, he's like, what do you got there, Hillary? You know, yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what are you holding there, Donald? And he's vacuuming up the classified. I, yeah, I think, I think part of it is, you know, we're expecting them to have that, that access to that information mm -hmm. um, without providing them with the ability to safeguard it, right? So I think, you know, that's, that's one of the key pieces where you have things like, you know, like Trump taking files and, and storing them in Mar-a-Lago. Let's, well, you know, I don't necessarily think, you know, or Pence or, or Biden or, or Hillary mm -hmm. Clinton, they needed that information. They needed access to that information. Part of the problem is, you know, with the... Um, authorization piece of it and you know an accreditation of a secure mm -hmm. facility how do you how do you still give them that ability to have mm -hmm. access to that information and provide it in a accredited area right you know where where they're able to get that that instant access to it that they need to make decisions well, that's not happening policies. i don't see trump exactly. sitting in the skiff that's all i'm saying right and <laughs> and so how do we you know how do we provide that for residences for, you know, high level national leaders mm -hmm. where, you know, their residence is also able to have a, a, an accredited location where they can have access to that information. And then you, and that's why we get things like their own servers mm -hmm. and, you know, boxes of documents and garages and other silly things that, that like blow your mind as, as right. a cleared professional, you know, and as someone you look at and you go, you know, if it was me, I'd be in jail at this point. You know, which is is probably true, right? If I had boxes of classified information in my garage, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, if people came and raided my garage and they're like, yeah, he's got boxes of classified information, <laughs> I would expect to be in jail for for taking that information. But yeah, it's a difficult thing. So. Um, kind of along that same lines, recently the Republicans have booted two Democrats from the Intelligence Committee um, I don't know m much about the other one, but I know a little bit about one. His name is Eric Swalwell. Um, yeah. he, is a, he is a Democrat, uh, but his I kind of understand. You know, uh, he was sleeping with a Chinese spy. I don't care what your political affiliation is. This person cannot be on the Intelligence Committee any more than the guy that's been lying his teeth out. I think George Soros. I don't know how this guy gets elected, but um, what are your thoughts on on these moves to kind of boot people like Eric Swalwell from the Intelligence Committee? You know, uh, so the old joke, uh, Mel Brooks joke from History of the World, right? It's good to be the king, right? So yeah. that that ruling party and being able to make right. those decisions of who's on what committees um, and being, you know, mm -hmm. in 
in that majority rule, right? And it it keeps flipping back and forth and people get kicked off committees and somebody's a chairperson. Now this, um, the ruling, you know, whoever's the ruling party at the time, I mean, that's the government that we've entrusted is we've, we elect individuals to govern on our behalf, right? As but, a republic. But, and so we, we give them that trust. And so whoever's got that ruling power at the time can make those decisions. The decisions to kick like people off yeah, there's there's some interpersonal piece to some of it, right? Where it's mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, you know, quid pro quo, tit for tat, you know, well, you said this and, and right, I didn't right. like it. So now you're not going to get to serve on my committee because now I'm in charge and it's my committee. So you don't get to be on it. I think there's that piece of it. And that's just, that's a part of our government. A lot of, you know, bickering right. and, and whatnot. I think some of the key pieces of, you know, things like they can serve on other committees, maybe not just, maybe not this one. Right. I've seen that over my career where people, yeah. you know, people that have lost their clearance mm -hmm. um, for, you know, whether that's personal decisions, whether that's financial decisions, um, whether, you know, they're just, it's a risk piece and, you know, they, they lose their clearance. Um, and again, it's not saying like you're a horrible person, you're a bad worker, you know, I mean, could have been a bankruptcy, right. could have been some poor financial decisions, um, like, you know, alcoholism, whatever the case may be that caused... Right you know, these very tragic events in their life that then become flags for, hey, you're kind of at risk. Mm -hmm. You're a risk factor for us at this point, but you're still a very useful analyst, person, manager, and you still have value. It's just not right, right here, <laughs> right? And so being able to- You don't have to go home. Them, you don't have to you go can't home. stay yeah, here. you can't stay right here. Um, and I had, I had a colleague that- um, you know, he, he had started dating uh, a Chinese national and, mm. um, you know, we had to talk to him and say, hey, if you continue down this path, you will likely lose your top secret, top secret clearance. What is it you want to do? And he's like, okay. I'm like, okay, you're breaking up. <laughs> okay. Right. And he's like, no, I'm staying together with, you know, we're going to stay together. I'm like, Okay, well, you know. You have to report that and all that thing. Yeah, yeah, and so it's like, okay, well, you may not have a job here in the Navy. Mm -hmm. You may have a job over here in the Navy, <laughs> right? And so knowing and understanding that, and it's, it's just, it's one of those things I think with Eric Swalwell, that's one of those things where it's like, that's fine. You can do some of these things, but you you yep. know, you're, you're free to choose your behavior and, and whatnot, who you date at whatever, but you can't, you're not free to choose the consequences. Mm -hmm. So I think in that regard, with respect to him, like you want to date a, a CCP party member national as a, you know, elected official for the mm -hmm. United States government, for somebody that's in our national defense strategy, <laughs> Um, that we we identify as mm -hmm. a key competitor in the global space, and they say that we are their competitor as well, right? So you got this, right. we are competing mutually with each other, and you want to date somebody that's a key member of their party. Okay, you can, but you don't get to choose the consequences of your behavior at right. that point. So you, you're free to do it, but you then can't dictate to us what the consequences are of your behavior. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the key pieces is you, you're free to choose what you want to choose. You just, you're yet, not free yet, to choose the again, consequences. Yet again, Steve, you're a lot nicer than I am. <laughs> you, you just think you're letting them off a lot easier than I am. Uh, in, in my opinion, this whole Eric Swalwell thing, um, there's, there's, there's a macro problem and there's a micro problem. The micro problem is what are, what are you doing sleeping with Fang Fang? I don't know who this Fang Fang person is, but is her name actually Fang Fang? I don't know. Sign number one. If someone has two names, stay away. All right. Um, the the macro problem that I see is that regardless of political affiliation, who's policing the politicians? They're supposed to police themselves, which is ridiculous. This guy continued to serve in the intelligence committee um, after this was a known fact that he was sleeping with with a Chinese spy, and he can put out all the you know politicians on both sides will play the game, right? Yeah. But the facts are this guy was sleeping with with a Chinese, a known Chinese spy. Uh, 
where's the responsibility at? You know, like where where's the responsible person that can say, hey, you know, you're a member of Congress. This is a big problem. China is a big problem. Yeah. They've infiltrated our schools, the universities throughout the country. They've infiltrated our minds via TikTok, right? Um, and they have all of this information that they've collected on us. And now they've infiltrated our government at the highest levels from what, from what we can tell. And it just seems like the politicians are scratching their head. There's no, there's nobody yeah. assigned to police the politicians. And that's my problem. Well, that's the yeah. macro pol- problem I, that I have with it. I think, I think there are some, you know, that, that, um, the, are willing to call each other out mm-hmm. on some things, right? Um, you know, Dan Crenshaw comes to mind, you know, but off the top call, of my head. Call each, so other out call each other out. And then stuff that's nonsense though. Right? Yeah. And, 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 and it, gets, it gets lost in the noise, yeah. right? Is, um, becomes very much a, mm-hmm. you know, boy who cried wolf, right? When you're, you're constantly calling out yeah. your, the they colleagues the across side. the aisle, um, where it just then becomes noise where you, right. you can't pick up what the relevant time when, you know, you say, Hey, bad Nick, you're doing this, bad Nick, you're doing this, bad Nick, you're doing mm-hmm. this. Well, then when it's really important, I say, Hey, uh, bad Nick, you're doing this. And everybody goes, God, he's always saying bad Nick. Right. I'm tired of listening to him saying bad Nick. And they just ignore it. Right. Because it's, there's a lot of constant bickering that when they do have something that's key and relevant and they say, Hey, whoa, 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 uh, Nick, you're doing something really bad. Right. It gets lost in the noise. Boy who cried wolf. Yeah, boy who cried wolf syndrome. The, a lot of it, right? It's just everybody looks at it and they go, that's ah, just, you know, politics. And they just ignore it. I think one of the other key pieces is, you know, who who's when you have politicians that are willing to call each other out on it, it gets lost. Right. Um, but then as the general public as well, we're really the ones that are electing these people to go to Washington to govern on our behalf. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's beholden on us to make responsible decisions. And I think it's probably one of the bad things about modern politics is when you say things like, whoa, that person dated a spy. And you go, eh. Yeah, right. You're but just trying to get them out. You're just, trying, you're just right, saying right, right. things. You're trying to smear them. It's yeah. a smear campaign. Or they go, yeah, but it's better than that person. Right. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, like, I'm right, willing right. to overlook this. Because they're not a Democrat or they're not a Republican. At least they're not a Republican or at least they're not a Democrat. So right. yeah, they're bombastic or they date spies or they can't <laughs> they can't handle classified information correctly, but at least they're not, you know, whoever. Right. And I person. think that's part of the part of the issue is when we when we say things like that, we then excuse behaviors mm-hmm. that would that interpersonally you'd say, I wouldn't associate with this person in my day-to-day life, but they're off in Washington and at least they're not so-and-so and I'm okay with that. And we start to excuse things and we start to excuse behavior. And then that's how people continue to stay in office despite scandals, despite events where, you know, d- you know, dismissive of normal human foibles mm-hmm. where they're like really big things that we dis, we excuse them and dismiss them as well because it's, you know, yeah. the evil you know versus the evil you what, don't know. What you're really talking about is, you know, the media's responsibility. And I always hate to point to ominous things in the distance and say, yeah. oh, this, you know, it's the system. Like, <laughs> this, I hate doing that. Like, to show me one particular thing that can change. Uh, but it's definitely an area where the media in general has has just – failed they don't just don't report things that are you know uh against their side of the fence or something like that as opposed to just being trusted and saying hey forget it the the side of the fence that i'm on is the united states that's the side of fence i'm on and if this is something that could harm our country then we need to report on this as as a media outlet i I just i don't even know if that media is there a media outlet that exists that is just the united states media outlet that is pro united states and says Hey, this is this is something that could ha- be harmful to our country, harmful to our intelligence community. This could get people killed, you know, leaking sources and things like that, operations that that the United States takes on around the world. I don't even think I don't think that that company exists. I could be wrong, and maybe somebody will, yeah. will let me know in the comments. But 
I ha- I don't think it exists. I don't I don't think there's a, a national one, and I think that's one of the the sad things with the state of, you know, uh, of modern media is you know there's a lot of them are owned. You know, you back up. You know, who owns this and who? Well, who owns that corp? Right? You say you have this this local news station, and you say, well, who mm-hmm. owns that? And then you back it up and go, well, who who owns that studio and who owns <laughs> right. that and who owns that? And you start backing it up further and further, right? And and you say things jokingly and like five people run all of, you know, right. five companies run all of the entire media for global. Um, and, you know, we can make statements like that and joke about it. But, you know, when they have different bosses and different priorities, you know, what you just – Mm-hmm. raised in these things of who who is the one that's willing to step up and who's the one that's willing to you know put their reputation on the line or put their profits on the line and say whoa 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 you know right profits be damned this is the right thing and i we have to tell people this and we have mm-hmm. to tell them what's going on or this information needs to get out there um a lot of times it's because we're worried about things like ratings profit right right uh viewership Am I gonna? Am I still gonna be able to stay in my job? Right. Mm-hmm. I I want to stay from year to year to year. And here's how I get my contract renewed. Right. Here's how we continue to grow our viewership. Here's how we grow our ad revenue. Who's willing to advertise mm-hmm. with us? We can't say things that upset our advertisers, right? Because then they they're not going to be willing to put ads on our network. And so there's so many different loyalties mm-hmm. that truth. Right, becomes something that's not very profitable. Well, so one of the things and, I like about about, about doing this podcast is that we don't have sponsors. Yeah, no right? sponsors. No loyalty. I don't have somebody trying to say, "Hey, you need to push this product," and I'm not doing that. I'm just not. Yeah. I'm not doing that unless there's a really good reason to do it. Yeah, reach out to us. You know, I'm not going to sit here and like uh, think about what I'm saying because some sponsor is going to, um, you know, be upset at something. You know, I'm financially free. I can sit here and talk about whatever I want. Yeah. And I'll face the consequences for that if people disagree or if I say something stupid, which happens often. Um, but you brought up something that I think uh, was interesting that happened recently. So Elon Musk bought Twitter, mm-hmm. right? Not soon after that, he starts releasing this information about Twitter's dealings with the presidential election, COVID, all these all these things that Twitter was highly involved with called the Twitter files. This yep. was via Matt Taibbi. And uh, I, th- I think it's funny because that's kind of what drew me back to Twitter. I'd not really use Twitter that much, but I'm like, yeah, if Elon Musk is running, it's probably going to be pretty damn good soon. So I started going on Twitter a little bit more. One of the things I noticed once the Twitter files started being released, are you on Twitter, by the way? I have a Twitter account. You have a Twitter, I'm okay. Not very active. All right, no. I mean, me, me neither, not till recently. Yeah. Um, but so so Elon Musk starts releasing these, these Twitter files, right? And I thought it was hilarious. There was journalists going through and responding, you know, uh, on their on these Twitter file threads and saying, you know, oh, look at Matt Taibbi. Uh, he's just he's just doing the bidding of a billionaire, right? And these are these are journalists at the Washington Post, yeah, which is owned by Jeff Bezos, the New York Times, which is owned by I'm sure another billionaire. You know, all these these media outlets. Yeah. Um, I just I think there's a lot of a lot of issues with traditional media and and hypocrisy and things like that. And I just thought that that was just like that. That is the the state of our media in 2023 in a nutshell, right there, right? Yeah. A journalist. Calling someone, uh, you know, saying that they're essentially licking the boots of a billionaire while they're licking the boots of a billionaire. You know, like it yeah. It just shows kind how, of where we're how's at. How's the saying go? Uh, those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, right? Like, right. So be cognizant of, you know, who you are, who you're working for type thing. But uh, yeah, it's, it becomes hilariously uh, obvious when people say hypocritical, hypocritical things like that where they're. You know, you have one journalist that like is being told what stories to do and what stories to report on, what not to report on, mm-hmm. calling out another journalist who's willing to do that and saying, oh, you're just doing, you're just doing what someone's telling you to do. I mean, that's been the state of journalism for years, right? Where you have a reporter mm-hmm. comes to their boss and with a story, right? And 
you have the adage of, you know, if it bleeds, it leads kind of thing and saying, you know, hey, drop that story, go do this instead, um, you know, where they they want to they want to say something or they want to do a story or they want to do an investigative piece on something and they get told leave it alone or drop it by their boss. Right. And I mean, that's been journalism for years where they try to do that, where you have somebody that's willing to do real exposés on things. Uh, it becomes like earth shattering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. that's that's really interesting. And uh, Tyler Cannon, our, our audio video tech right now, he sent me something saying, check out um, ground.news. So he said uh, yeah. this might be a site worth looking at. So definitely check that out if you're out there, ground.news. I, I just brought it up really quickly. It looks pretty straightforward. It looks just from looking at the headlines, I haven't read into it. Um, it might be something worth exploring. But from the headlines, you know, it's it doesn't. It looks pretty unbiased. It says, you know, the, the top headline is U.S. economy grew at end of 2022, defying recession fears. Okay, Boeing to be arraigned in court over two Max jet crashes. I don't see any spin. Um, uh, no emotion. A lot of facts, right? And that's right. actually, you know, that's sadly one of the things where we talk about, mm-hmm. you know, getting back to like truth and understanding, right? Is, you know, we always joke about, you know, there's, there's three sides to every story, his, Mm -hmm. hers, and the truth, right? Right. You you know, jokingly (laughs) saying things like that. Um, But I know a lot of people that, you know, for years and years will watch multiple news channels because they're like, I'll watch CNN, Mm -hmm. Fox, Al Jazeera, BBC, you know, OAN, they'll watch a bunch so that they can Pull in all that information and kind of get, you know, what's what's the real strip away case? the nuance and the emotion right. uh to it and and get to the key facts. Mm-hmm. And and it sounds like this this news source is a good one for yeah. like, we're gonna strip away the emotion and the inflammatory statements and and a lot of mm-hmm. that, you know, key pieces that are gonna get people hyped up on something and elicit emotion. They're not trying to elicit emotion, they're trying to inform. Right. And you know, all the social media apps, obviously, they like that when they're when news is being put out there and people are engaging with the content because that drives the algorithms, drives them the push. That's exactly they what want. they're looking for is engagement. Right. Engagement is what we drives need, it. We need you Here, engaged. Here's what I found interesting. This is on ground.news. And I haven't seen a headline like, this, like lit, written straightly like this. Meta to restore Donald Trump's Facebook Instagram accounts. I have not seen a headline written about that guy that hasn't been spun one way or the other. If you yeah. you look at a Fox News headline, it's going to spin it to the right, heavily biased. You look at a CNN, it's going to spin it way left, heavily biased. MSNBC, same way. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. Appreciate that, Tyler. We'll, we'll definitely, uh, I'll definitely do some research on that, ground.news. Um, very cool, very cool. So I'm hoping that you'll do a, a separate little segment with me. <laughs> uh, it'll be a little bit of fun, a little bit of overtime. Are you willing to stick around for sure. that? Sure. All yeah. right, awesome. Well, I hope everybody else does too. So stick around for overtime. Uh, we'll we'll do that as a separate clip on YouTube and then uh, on the podcast. I don't know if I'll put it out on audio yet. We'll see. But uh, definitely, if you're listening on audio, also check us out on YouTube and go ahead and subscribe while you're there. This is the NDS Show. <laughs>